It's November 6th, 2022. This is a special edition of Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 213 of Rook. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Then stand against the executions in Iran. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam Dustan Aziz. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Because if you want to answer yes and show support and are asking how, take a stand against the executions in Iran right now. Here's a quick thought experiment. Imagine the national parliament in, say, Stockholm or Ottawa or London or Washington were to pass a resolution urging the judiciary of a Western country to kill its own citizens for participating in a protest and exercising freedom of expression. Do you really think that would fly? Do you not think there would be an international outcry? Because here's hoping that the outrageous atrocities of this regime in Iran are not so normalized or so expected that the world won't wake up to this latest development. To be clear, yesterday, 227 illegitimate members of the Islamic Parliament of Iran demanded the death sentence for protesters who attended recent demonstrations inside the country. This would mean the potential execution of thousands. And this is to actually codify the murder of the Iranian people. It defies belief. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Then stand against the executions in Iran. Maya Angelou once famously said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Of course, this could apply to this regime back to the 1980s, but now it's not even open to interpretation. It's in their own words. Iranian lawmakers are telling us who they are. Executioners. Now do you believe them? You see, there isn't even a pretense anymore. In the early weeks of this new revolution led by young girls and boys, powerful brave women and men, the murders committed by the regime usually came with hackneyed excuses. She was killed by protesters, or the girl had a heart attack, or he was attacking police and they had to respond, and so on and so on. Now the regime has shamelessly taken the floor. They aren't even hiding it anymore. If you protest, we will execute you. This isn't the Hunger Games. This is real-life brutal reality in today's Iran, and the international community needs to step up immediately. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Then stand against the executions in Iran. Oh, the regime has its reasons, of course. The Speaker of the Parliament says the CIA and Mossad are behind all the unrest. Raisi tells us they're all terrorists. Really, though? Even the young children you massacred in Zahidan? And let's use the term judiciary loosely as well. We're talking about bullshit charges, sham trials, and trumped up sentences. There is no agenda to any of this other than retaining power and quashing any opposition. And what has been the UN position? According to estimates from a couple of days ago, which are almost certainly too low, the Islamic Republic assault on the people of Iran has left over 320 killed, over 5,340 injured, over 14,170 arrested, over 1,000 people, many of them teenagers, have been taken to court in Tehran alone. And what has the impressive UN Human Rights Council reaction been so far? Zero resolutions, zero emergency sessions, zero commissions of inquiry. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? You know, sadly, a lot of those of us who come from a Middle Eastern background are inclined to cynically say no. The lines are drawn. The world will never care as much about someone from a place like Iran. But if you think differently, why don't you prove us wrong? Dear international institutions and governments and corporations, change this narrative forever. Answer these horrific executions with actions. Close your embassies, call back your ambassadors, sanction every one of these Iranian regime lawmakers and their families and Western bank accounts, kick Iran out of the World Cup or the UN or whatever you have to do. And then, then, you will let us know an Iranian life is worth the same as a Western one. Children are being murdered and they're turning this practice into a law? How much more will the international community allow? Surely, if the world is going to step up, the time is now. Coming up on this episode of Rook, powerful Iranian voices located in different parts of the world, including Negin Parsa in Istanbul, Parastu Fatemi in Dusseldorf, 
and Cameron Hansarinia in Washington, D.C., plus our Rook Roundtable. This is Rook, episode 213, The Uprising. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Stand against the executions. Right there we go. I'm back in the studio in Toronto. Got back late last night. Happy to be back here. Uh, hi, Pega. Hello. And hi, Shia. Hi, yes, is that? The Rook Welcome on Air back. Team. Merci, merci, Khusho, Madame. Khusho, I'm happy to be back. Uh, although I very much appreciated the spending the time in Istanbul over the last uh, nine days. Um, learned so much. Um, and very much looking forward to sharing um, this documentary that we shot, uh, mm-hmm. hopefully before too long, about the the uprising from the perspective of that proximity, being that close to Iran, yeah. was so interesting on so many levels for me. And of course, we've been playing some interviews from it last week, mm-hmm. uh, and we'll get to who we, we've got today too. But anyway, nice to be here. Yeah, um, good nice, to have nice you back. to see you guys. Um, well, actually, why don't I mention it now? Coming up uh, in about an hour from now, um, a special guest who I interviewed in Istanbul a couple of days ago, Negin Parsa. Now, if you don't know who Negin Parsa is, she's got a a, a very um, a powerful, very difficult story of her own of being exiled from Iran not too long ago. I think it's been mm-hmm. a year or less that mm-hmm. she's been in Istanbul. She's a singer and songwriter. Uh, one of the things that well, I'll, I'll leave it for to, for her story. You'll, you'll hear it. Uh, it was a very very uh, emotional and um, very open interview we had uh, a couple of days ago. I have to thank her. She really kind of really opened up about her own story and how um, the events in Iran have, have been very traumatic for her, as triggering her, and and yet uh, and how she hasn't been able to sleep. She's been taking pills. She's mm-hmm. been trying to cope with. Um, seeing what's happening, including all the uh, the deaths and and uh, you know, all that we know about what's happening in Iran, uh, and at the same time, she's been unable to prevent herself from wanting to do something. You know, even from that proximity of mm-hmm. Turkey, where of course we've talked about um, it being scary to speak out there, um, and I can say that more openly now when I'm back here. Uh, it's uh, it's tough, and it's a suppressive atmosphere. Beautiful, of course. I everything I've always loved about Istanbul is still there, but um, in terms of dissent, uh, political organizing, or and freedom of expression, uh, it's a really suppressive place. You know, in terms of any any of that being allowed, and therefore, uh, in some cases, it was difficult for us to get guests. Mm-hmm. In some cases, guests who ne- even know us and are enthusiastic about our show. Uh, and would come on for any other reason. We're like, I'm not speaking right now, not from here, not wow. this close to Iran. Uh, and for some of the reason we, reasons we talked about last week, well, Nagin Parsa is not fearful at all um, or not showing any fear, and, and she is in Istanbul. Not only has she been outspoken, but she's recorded this song now mm-hmm. that has, in the last few days, become an anthem, an, another uh, anthem of there's a few anthems of the revolution. Of course, the the great uh, Shervin uh, song is is Barry is forever going to be the iconic yes. uh, sound of this revolution. Mm-hmm. But there's a few other in amongst all the songs that are recorded uh, recorded a few songs that are are popping out and and this one now has uh, as of today in four or five days 3.5 million plays, mm-hmm. wow. which for an original song, not just a a um, another version of Barry is is really. Um, Impressive, and it's because it's so powerful. You want to play a little bit of it? Oh yeah! yeah just this is Negin Parsa's latest uh, um, song that she recorded for. Uh, go ahead, just go and play us a little bit. Too. Zan azad manam div tuli fetch 
نه توی مرد آزاد من این دیگر افسان نیست ها که زمان توی این دیگر افسان نیست کابه ی آهنگر منم یا رومی روم یا سنگی yeah, so- I mean, he will play the whole thing towards the end of the show and as part of the interview with her, but um, um, that that comes with a very powerful video of her singing and, and based on when you learn about all that she's been through, if you don't already know some of her story, you see the catharsis for her in singing this. I mean, it's very emotional even as she's singing this song in this video. Um, anyway, this, this has got millions of views already and... Uh, and so we recorded an interview a couple of days ago in the studio, in right where she sang the song, uh, oh. where she recorded the song, yeah, and um, and talked about the song, but talked about everything else. Uh, uh, and she's got such a, a powerful perspective as someone who's just come from Iran, as a woman who um, wanted to sing and play music in Iran and um, famously defied the uh, the authorities there by going on stage and... and doing so uh and uh so we hear all of that so negin parsa we'll give you that interview most of that of that interview i should note is in persian um in about an hour from now uh i i find that that song of hers yeah uh, i mean it just bowls you over it's yeah, amazing yeah. it really does first time i listened to it i had goosebumps yeah. and i was crying and it was just i mean i can only imagine what she felt considering everything we've now heard from you yeah. about her you know her journey and well wait resources. till you hear the, the yeah, interview it's, it's a quite something she's she's quite a and and she's i think the lyrics are taken partly from some of the chants that yes. people are right yeah. um for, for people who don't speak persian those are from some familiar mm-hmm. uh lyrics that um that she's uh adopted for the that's the sake of the song um negin parsa from Istanbul, uh, that interview. Uh, even while we were there doing the interview, every Iranian media outlet from outside of Iran mm-hmm. was trying to contact her. Wow. So I feel quite special that uh, <laughs> we did this interview. Yeah. I, I'm not surprised. She'll be everywhere the next oh, sure. week. I think uh, she was kind of deciding which interview she wanted to do and not. But um, I think she says in the interview, there's a few things she says that she hasn't said before. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's quite a story. I have to thank Negin for, for doing this. So we've got her coming up. Um, before that, uh, we're going to go to Washington, D.C. Um, and Cameron Khansadinia, who's the policy director for the National Union for Democracy in Iran. This is a, a new group called NUFTI. It's a nonpartisan, nonprofit group of uh, Iranian Americans trying to raise awareness about freedom, freedom movement uh, in Iran. And um, Cameron's a very, very thoughtful guy. It's going to be a, interesting to talk to him about. Partly I want to talk to him about the possibilities of, you know, we, we're starting to hear talk now of who's the leadership going to be mm-hmm. and should we develop this council. I know that you want to talk about that, Pega. Yeah. And, and lots of other things in terms of the details of where things go from here and the role that people in the diaspora should be playing. These are things, a lot of things that Cameron's been um thinking about so uh we'll go to him and before that coming up in just a little bit right after our round table here parastu fatemi i'm very thankful to her for coming on the program she's in dusseldorf germany and she has been doing work in the human rights sector for uh many years including particularly dealing with uh, the connection between human rights activists inside and outside iran and providing information and data on um international related organizations when it comes to children's rights, women's rights, persons with disabilities. Um, and Pat Astu, um, I'm going to, you know, uh, talk to her about this, uh, this latest majlis order mm-hmm. that I o- talked about in the opening essay yeah. and what she makes of it um, uh, and the, it, how in- international organizations, um, even <laughs> the... Um, impotent UN uh, can try and do something here. So um, that's all coming up uh, on this show, uh, episode 213. Um, what did you make of this Majlis thing? I mean, I, I, I've done an essay on it, so people have a sense of my outrage, but yeah. uh, it, it's every time you think that the regime is doing something um, horrific and bizarre and there can, there can be no lower, it's mm-hmm. like lawmakers actually, you know, um, putting it 
like trying to put it into law like yeah. we will kill you we will execute you for uh, for being a child who's demonstrating i mean mm-hmm. it's it is it is one of the most horrific things i've ever seen i mean i just i'm blown away continuously by the audacity of this regime mm. um and i mean i shouldn't be i guess but um, you know, what, what you're referring to, it was actually an open letter um, that was signed by 227 of the 290 members of parliament. And so I had a look at this letter, um, and some of the things that they mentioned is that, firstly, um, they compared the protesters to the likes of ISIS and other terrorist organizations and noted that um, these peaceful protesters, who they call terrorists, have waged war against the Islamic establishment and attacked Iranians' lives and properties, as if they're not Iranian. Um, so it's this change in change and shift in narrative of you know before it's you know they got killed yeah. because um, they had pre pre existing condition or the yeah. protesters killed them or a dog bit them or something ridiculous like that, and now there's a shift that they're terrorists and also the irony is that this comes after you know they've already started these trials, so all of it is just you know sham like you said yeah. in your which. The trials, quote unquote. I yes. mean, yeah. What's I don't even know the point well, of these court, you know. Yeah, I mean, apparently, what's happened is over the last week, um, they've already had some of these individuals put on trial, and um, the r- the most ridiculous part of it is that um, it's without representation. So these individuals don't have their lawyers. They're supposed to be public trials, and yet the individuals' families aren't allowed there. Um, I'm not even sure if they're televised, so I don't mm. really know how they're exactly supposed to be public. Mm. Um, and I mean, it's just one thing after another. And like I said, I'm baffled by the audacity. Well, what the, the audi- on the audacity point, and this isn't something that I particularly said in that essay just now, but I, it's clear that the regime doesn't give a shit about international opinion. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, oh. at least those lawmakers. That's right. Uh, now, maybe if you sanction them and make it so that your son can't, drive his Lamborghini in the streets of Vancouver or mm-hmm. something like that, maybe that'll make a difference. I don't know. But right now, those people clearly don't care oh, what no. anyone thinks. They're doubling down, and it's yeah. it's it's let, uh, let's let crack down. And we always said this. We always yeah. said that this is going to happen, and, and the next reality will be... God forbid, falling through with the, with these mm-hmm. executions, which they're already doing. They're but, already doing but in on, on a mass level, yeah. um, with really no, uh, it's like they're in their own bubble, or you know, and everyone else is everyone in the world, including the kids, and as I said, in Zaidan and mm-hmm. and the the people demonstrating in Berlin, and you know, people in Australia, and the folks I spoke to in Istanbul, everyone's an operative of the CIA That's and Mossad, right. uh, and we're all terrorists, and <laughs> the only people, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. I, I don't even know how much they buy their own bullshit, yeah. uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it, it is crazy how little they care about the international community, or how omnipotent they feel. Mm-hmm. Maybe they, though, that's that's one side of the coin of of feeling so scared that they this is their reaction that let's kill them all. You but know? I mean, what you're saying about um, you know them not caring about the international community and things like that. I mean, look at the language that they're using, right? Even in this open letter, they were quoted to say things like "show no leniency" and "teach these protesters a good lesson." I mean, if you had any ounce of care for you know any sort of international opinion mm. or even opinion of your own people that's not what you would be saying in wasn't it only a week ago or something that one of these guys was saying well that we can sit down and talk about things and uh, i guess they've tried everything yeah. and now so and i was just like let's kill people yeah. more yeah and even in the parliament the mm, pr- the the guy who represent the uh, Zahedan people, mm. Hajj people, when he started to talk ag- about what happening in Zahedan, they turned off his mic. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they turned off his mic. Yeah. Khomeini said, like uh, um, mm. when he took power, he said, "Hefse Nizam." Oh, jabe vajabat has. It well. means like <laughs> it means like um, uh, maintaining the uh, the regime yeah. is the priority yeah. uh, of yeah. So they would do anything to. They're listening. They're listening to the uh, the origi- original leaders' words, mm-hmm. <laughs> the OG words. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> well, so that's that's the latest in mm-hmm. terms of the Majlis. Yeah. What did you think of? Um, there's a few couple of things that I want to get to our guests, but a couple of things that I I wanted to mention. Um, do you know that today is uh, two week? I think it's two weeks away from the World Cup. Oh, <laughs> yep. which is is it's a whole other different world cup for iranians than it normally is i mean even when iran isn't in the world cup iranians are all excited about the Mm -hmm. world cup uh we're football people and and i'm usually super stoked about the world cup and and uh and i'm i'm still excited i guess for iran and canada (laughs) although i feel that uh i mean it's been a decade of getting ready for this world cup in in qatar and knowing all the all the issues in terms of um, holding a, a, a major tournament there. But now we've got the added layer of, of um, Team Mali yeah. and um, good friends of mine. I mean, I'm, we might try and bring somebody on the show on Thursday, but who are basically saying, I, uh, the really, really close friend of mine who's a big football fan as part of what he does does saying I, I'm not even going to, mm-hmm. I'm not going to watch. I boy, I'm boycotting the World Cup. Yeah, there's a I lot. I don't know if that'll still be the case once it starts but there's a lot of conversation with people who are big football fans saying you know should we even consider watching it this year should we ban it um i have friends who had tickets you know months in advance and they had been planning for this months and months in advance and now they're thinking what do i do with these tickets do i sell them do i go if i go you know what do i wear should i somehow show um the sense of protest do we all wear the same color black white colors of the team you Mm. know or red, white, and green, like there's all these conversations being had. And I mean, it's so hard because I'm a big football fan. Typically around this time, I'd be, you know, looking at schedules and when the Iran game is and trying to celebrate and all that, but it just doesn't feel the same this year. And there, even in my mind, there's some consideration of, you know, should this, should this be banned? Should we be banning the the World Cup or supporting and well, know, it's there seems to be, I mean, there's a, there's a spectrum, you know, at one end of the spectrum is, oh, it's a sport, let them, you know, yeah. the players shouldn't have to be punished for what the regime is doing, let them play, whatever. At the other end is, screw this, don't watch, don't support in any way, mm-hmm. don't, um, and call for the, the Iran to be kicked out. Somewhere in between is, I know there's some, the hope of some people, I mean, Roham on our team keeps saying they might still do something, you know, yeah. maybe they'll turn up with a, the wrong jerseys on to show a protest or something. Won't that be great? I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's it's a really great unknown. Uh, I mean, by great, I mean a, a, a big mm-hmm. unknown of what, of both what Team Melly is going to do and... Or not do. And what the, what how we're all going to react. Mm-hmm. And, and to a certain extent, because there's so much solidarity being shown with Iranians around the world, um, I feel like we're all going to have the, the. I don't know how much dissenting there's going to be allowed. You know, if 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 the if the crowd is if the crowd the global diaspora and people inside Iran are going, don't watch. It's going to be hard to be like, uh, hey guys, <laughs> let's yeah, all. You know, exactly. I mean, I don't know, right? But I mean, uh, recently there was that video of the Iranian beach football. Is it? Is yeah, it was yesterday. Was yeah. yeah. So I mean, the action that he took after he scored the goal, pretending like he was cutting his hair, yeah. and now that's gone viral. And you know, I mean, that's also something you could do in in a situation. That's like, the idea that right? they'll they'll do some, but yeah. But, yeah, I mean, but it's also been like months, and and, nothing. and you have the you have the position of someone like uh, Nafi Sev, who we had on our roundtable last Thursday, whose position, as you know, was mm-hmm. well, if 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 rock musicians have to cancel their concerts and filmmakers are not making films, why are these players playing at all? I I know it's a difficult. I mean, we're going to yeah. open that can of worms, yeah, but yeah. I don't know if I agree with that either. No, right? I, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And I don't. I, I always have trouble blaming the players. Yeah. Um, but I get it. I get the instinct to want to yeah. because it's like, um, all right. So what, what 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 are you thinking about the World Cup? I mean, uh, <laughs> it's really challenging. It's really challenging. Um, but if they, I mean, if they don't ban Iran from World Cup, I think they're not going to ban Iran from yeah. the World Cup. Do you think? Two weeks, Two weeks left? No, I don't no. think so. And if also, FIFA said, like, uh, don't make it, like... Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a yeah. shuhi wish that. Um, f- I, I don't know. I mean, the f- uh, 
uh, football federation in Iran actually they said that they are going to punish the beach football yeah. players and so of course <laughs> yeah I mean it, 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 it's a uh, as you said it's a big unknown yeah yeah yeah, I c- uh, it's a. Can you imagine that that the time we're living in, where by acting out the cutting of your hair mm-hmm. after and uh, celebrating a goal, could mean? I mean, look, if they're passing a law to execute people for attending demonstrations, That's when right. something's like a goes viral like this, you know that guy's probably going to be punished. He's, a, he's an athlete. He's yeah. you know in yeah. that position, and he knew what he was doing when he did it. I mean, I'm sure he was aware of the potential consequences, the likely consequences, in fact. Do we have any update on Tumaj, the 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 great rapper who has been nothing yet, right? Nothing but yet. But we know there's. A, I know oh, I missed it because I was coming back from Istanbul. But in Toronto here, we had a yeah there was a rally. There was a rally yesterday. Um, it was actually organized by a group of um, local volunteers. I think they're called a uh, group called Poetic justice for Iran, if I'm not mistaken, something along those lines. And um, they held a rally at Mel Asman Square to pay tribute to Tumaj and also bring continued awareness to what's happening in Iran. And I think Tumaj just became the symbol um, of this ongoing revolution and this continuous drive. Of one of the symbols. One of the yeah, symbols, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, uh, of this generation. And so that was at Mel Asman, and I think there was quite a big turnout. Um, and I believe his cousin yeah, actually that's was what I there. Heard, yeah. um, and it wasn't pre planned. She just, you know, like anyone else in the city, saw that this rally was happening and, and she was there. And um, when it became known that she was there, she said a couple of words, mm. and that was so emotional. And I mean, yeah, nothing, nothing other than that at this point, I think. We, we we talked about Sherwin the other yeah. on the other episode that it's really ridiculous. You I, imagine like you are a the, the, who you are a rapper here and mm-hmm. they come and arrest you for yeah. arrest for Drake. Yeah, for, yeah. <laughs> for yeah. for just saying uh, yeah. truth. You know, it's it's and he was violently arrested from oh, from yeah. what I read, and it was him and two friends. And I haven't read as much about his two friends, so I don't even know what's happening mm. there, but. Um, I think last Saturday they, it was this almost horrible way of yeah. attacking him at home. Um, before we get to our first guest, I mean, you know, fingers crossed for too much and, and, and all the people who are being detained right now. Um, before we get to our first guest, uh, the, I wanted to talk, we've been seeing a lot of chat about this potential, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll ask our guests about this, especially Cameron, because I think he's probably... I don't know if he's part of this or something, but the the, the this talk of a council, mm-hmm. it, the opposition trying it's it feels like a a push and pull where um, we we keep talking about how and I think or at least I do correctly I think we should look at the young people of Iran as the people who are leading this thing um, and how can we support them how can we support the people who are uh, fighting for a revolution inside Iran and at the same time there's um, there's a desire to kind of organize in the diaspora uh, a a strong and credible united opposition since the the goal for everybody is to get rid of the regime. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's been this new, where does this come from? Uh, this, uh, this proposition to to bring well-known opposition figures yeah. together? Well, the first I saw of it was a um, famous Iranian cartoonist by the name of Monane Estani. Um, he put up a image on Instagram, I believe, and shared it with a very lengthy caption kind of talking about this council and the idea of this council. So I don't know if that's where it originated, but that's the first um, place that I saw it. And so what was said about it... It's been a few it, days now, though. This has been... Yeah, it's yeah. been a few days. It's been circulating. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of conversation that's mm-hmm. being had about the image itself and the people who were in that cartoon. Um, but the, the general idea is that um, there's this formation of a temporary council composed of um, prominent figures within the diaspora who would come together to discuss potential next steps. Um, The idea is that if these voices come together for their unity, they can kind of strengthen. Um, It would help weed out some of the voices who are there for potentially wrong reasons or don't want to support this ongoing revolution. Um, And it would actually allow international bodies to know who to quote unquote sit down with. So Mm. I think that was one of the main points of it. Um, Also, you know, it's been said that this should happen in the diaspora because obviously within Iran, 
this can't happen right now. Mm. Um, albeit that the youth are doing an incredible job of mobilizing and driving this revolution forward, but a council such as this wouldn't be able to take place or form right. in Iran right now. Right. Um, and you know uh, the the main thing about it is that it's a step forward. It's the next mm. step in what's been happening over the last fifty days. Mm-hmm. And who decide, who is in the council? That's we the big know, question. Right? So in the image, mm-hmm. um, you know, there are a couple of main names that we've seen, obviously, over the last 50 days. So I think drawn into the Hamed cartoon is, is Hamed um, Masiani Najad, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. I think Kavish Ahruz is one of the No, people. Ali Karimi. Ali Karimi. Ebadi and Reza Pahlavi. Okay. Yeah miss those um, but uh, there is a note at the bottom of the caption that says you know this is just a cartoon image it's not mm. to say that these are the actual people who should be part of this council but it's more an idea that's being presented if mm. something like that happens um, then we have to be mo- because since the, the uprising ca- happened we are always talking about the, un- the unity that this time is different mm-hmm. yeah. so if uh, I ca- if I can imagine like Ali Karimi next to Reza Pahlavi next to like um, Hamid Ismailiun. So, I mean. That's it, unity. <laughs> that, that, that Shirin Abadi. Shirin Abadi and yeah. Masih. That could be a, a, like a picture of unity. Yeah. But I have to say there's two points mm. that I definitely agree with. And one is, you know, this would allow international bodies, if they actually want to do something and, and step up to the plate, so mm. to speak, to have a known person or persons mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. meet with that's the first thing the other thing is that um you know finances can be discussed how do we raise money to yeah. help those in iran and it could go through this council so that would also be something that would be very very helpful mm-hmm. but i mean who would be on this council is the big big question yeah uh look if it if it can be effective to um coalesce support mm-hmm. uh it's it is true that they're weirdly there, there isn't a spokesperson, right? That that right. the media can sort of go, who holds press conferences and goes, "Here's where we're at," or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. But also, that's what's great about this, yes. right? <laughs> right? I mean, there's a thousand spokespeople, exactly. and there's uh, you know, um, and a lot, some of them are very prominent, and that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's hard to it's hard to. I mean, I if it if it can be effective, I'll I would I have no problem with it, but I. Um, I'm. I am a little worried about the tendency to, yeah. to, for for the, for the, the jockeying of who's going to be on some council, you know, outside of Iran to become the distraction rather than the yeah. the support uh, that it needs to be. So I would hope that if it can seamlessly come together and everybody mm-hmm. can be happy, sure, why not? But if if rather than supporting the people of Iran. Uh, in a revolution, there's you know an ongoing debate about whether this person should be on or yeah. what is why is she there and who's he and I mean I, I you know you're and you're so right about the funds that's yeah, an interesting that's thing the because there's it, been a few yeah. uh, groups that have come up some of them people I know and I like the people you know but who go hey can you advertise this to mm-hmm. send money to us to the, and I think well I I would like to but I. I, I she, how do we decide exactly. who's the uh, there's going to be a finite amount of funds that people have so you can't donate to everything and and it would be really great if there was some organized attempt to mm-hmm. to support the opposition uh like the a strike fund or something you know yeah. for people inside iran um all right um thank you pega nice to see you nice to be back nice in toronto you. thank you shia stick around buddy and let's get to our first guest uh, my first guest is a refugee counselor in Germany and has been a human rights advisor for more than 12 years. Parastu Fatemi is the founder of the Raha Association, which connects human rights activists from inside and outside Iran and provides information and data to the international related organizations on children's rights, women's rights, and persons with disabilities. Right now, Parastu Fatemi joins me from Dusseldorf, Germany today. Hello. Hello, dear uh, Jean. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. You know, you're you're not somebody who's you're not only somebody who's doing important work. You've lived it to a certain extent as well as uh, in living in exile with your your family due to your own family politics and having to move out of the country. Let me start with a very general question. As someone who works in the space of human rights and particularly with respect to Iran, 
H- how have you uh, processed the last couple of months? Have you been inspired by the strength of the movement for freedom in Iran or devastated by the killings and imprisonments, sad at the, the whole situation? How are you processing it? Honestly, it's difficult to say if I'm surprised uh, by the regime because in the past years, I was conducting a lot of reports about the mass human rights violation in Iran. And uh, that was not something unexpected. But unfortunately, um, I, I can say it still is my job as a human rights uh, advisor, but uh, I cannot uh, accepting all of this um, psychological pressure and in my personal life. That affected me a lot. But I'm really surprising by the power of women in Iran and how they inspired worldwide. And uh, actually in Middle East, it's kind of first um, modern uh, revolution from a uh, women's side, maybe also worldwide. I cannot, I, I don't have exact research on that, but I can say I'm really inspired because I compare on the time when I lived in Iran. And I can say the women in Iran, they are really courageous and I, I admire them. What are they doing? Uh, what are they doing that you wouldn't have done? I hear, I, we've been hearing this so much that we say to each other, "Wow, these young women, these young girls, and the young boys and 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 men too, or who are out on the front lines, are doing have a strength that we didn't have somehow." What What is it for you? What are they doing that you th- you sort of think, "Oh my God, I, I wouldn't have even been able to do that myself." Uh, you know, um, if I want to compare with myself, when I was in Iran, I did some activity, I was an activist, I uh, flee from Iran, but it was all kind of hidden. Uh, we, we, it, we had a really difficulty to uh, express ourselves. Many of my classmates, they didn't know if I uh, used to live also in exile in Iran due to political background of my parents. So uh, it was not really easy to talk about my uh, personal life, to about my behavior, if I'm an atheist or not. So all of this uh, affected my childhood. And I admire now the persons and the uh, persons in Iran, generally men and uh, women and children, uh, and they know what they are doing and their slogans are really clear and Mm. they are targeting the regime and their um, Khamenei as a supreme uh, supreme leader and uh, Basijis, uh, Mullahs and so on. So uh, that's kind of really encourage um, a movement. And how I say and how they react uh, in universities, and they are really ready and brave. Yeah. How they are reacting, and they they have a, such a, a unique unity at the moment. I've been in Istanbul for the last week, uh, talking to people there, Iranians there, supporting the uprising. And one thing, one idea that came uh, kept coming up is that um, the young people in Iran are. Um, one of the things they that we have done or people previous generations have done for them is 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 um um, screwed things up <laughs> so that they've kind of learned the mess, not intentionally screwed things up, but not been able to bring down the regime. So so they are operating with 43 years, 44 years of knowledge of what doesn't work and what doesn't, what hasn't been effective and, and what hasn't led to change. And they, they've accumulated that like a sponge. And now it almost seems sort of natural to the point where some remarkable things that I mean, we talked about on our last show. Like, for example, um, they put out a, a, a fake, what we know to be a fake confession video of Tumaj, and the entire community, including those in Iran, know not to share that. Nope, don't share it. Which is something that wouldn't have been as easily known, wouldn't have been as obvious, say, 10, 15 years ago. Does that make sense to you that they've accumulated this knowledge based on mistakes of the past? We learn uh, by our experiences and by our history and current history. This kind of systematic uh, method, uh, what's the uh, Iranian regime they are using to suppress uh, our activists, journalists, um, um, uh, actually uh, the uh, writers, uh, actors, rapper, and so on. That happened uh, several times. And they did uh, this kind of um, interviews, which the people, they are not believing anymore. So if either they try to uh, broke their uh, presence in, uh, in the national way, the people, they know this is not a real um, right. uh, confession because it was not based on the reality and they, they are not helping them to express it more and uh, viral the uh, videos. I was really impressed myself. I can say that was something very uh, brave and I'm uh, also <laughs> impressed by the action and reactions of the people and in social media, how they acted and they ignored to publish it again. 
As as somebody past you who's been looking at this stuff for years, you said a moment ago that you're not really that surprised. Um, it's horrific to watch what's happening. That, I mean, just the shooting of kids in Zahedan or or what's happening in San Andaj or even in the streets of Tehran. Uh, how, how much worse are the violations being committed by the orders of this regime today than they were before this current uprising? If we compare to the decade of 80s, uh, they did a mass um, uh, this, um, this executions and this penalties for the political activists at that time. I, I can say almost about 5,000 uh, more or less. Still, we don't have appropriate number. And uh, they, they try to hide it and they try to ignore it. They didn't accept it. But now they don't have any fear. So they just bring those kind of violations and um, killing and mass killing of their uh, oppositions in the street. So they don't care if it's a children, if it's a, a adults, if it's women and men, if it's a person with disabilities. We saw either they kill the person with disabilities in, during these demonstrations. So we are not talking about humans and they don't have heart and uh, mm. these kind of actions from the regime was expected in the past, but it was kind of difficult to uh, prove it uh, to the society. And now they don't care at all about the international society because they don't see, they don't make any proper suppression on them. Uh, can I, I mean, as a sidebar, maybe people will think I'm I'm tremendously naive for even asking this, but, but say, you know, you're an older person sitting and watching state television in, in Iran and you're not connected to the internet and you, you don't have a proclivity, proclivity against this regime in general. How, how does the regime itself justify by what by any measure can be considered the equivalence of war crimes? Like what, what is the, what would they, if, if you were to say, um, how you're killing children, how do you justify that? What do they even say? Um, I don't know if it's a manipulation. If some people, they don't want to open their eyes, if they just uh, refer to some certain uh, references from the regime, like a national TV. But to be honest, I don't think if one person want to be clear and open their eyes and see what is going in a society, mm. they don't understand. I think they don't want to understand and they don't want to hear. It's all uh, based on the benefits uh, and in all uh, other dictator uh, governments and regime, we saw the similar actions. So this kind of the refuses and also um, the, how their people belong to the regime, they are reacting. This happens also in other parts of the world. Right. But none of those, those dictators is remain for a uh, right. long life. But presumably all of these protesters, all of the people in Iran who want who who are out there in the streets, all of them are just agents of America, misled people listening to Israel. I mean what who <laughs> you know, I mean what what what, what how, how how can they uh, maybe I'm I'm asking too much to to even get think about how they justify if they're murdering they're murdering. But I, I'm curious how they justify this in their own minds, how they think what they're doing is okay. Um, energy, and sometimes I tell myself, maybe some person still is exist uh, in within this government, and maybe maybe they don't know what is going on. But today I was really surprised how I saw the reaction of the Majlis Parliament in Iran, and 227 of these yeah. uh, illegitimate uh, members of the Parliament, they urge and they ask for judiciary system yeah. to sentence the protester to death penalty. So. How could be? How could be yeah. two hundred twenty-seven person doesn't see what's going in a country? So they are the examples of the persons who belong to the government, and they are the per, uh, examples of those people who belong to IRGC. And based on their benefits and their economy and their uh, position, they don't want to lose it, yeah. and they try whatever to use to suppress the demonstrants and the people against the regime. So. Honestly, I cannot say how they justify it yes. because for me, is nothing to justify. Let, let me ask you specifically about that and, and whether it represents a moving a moving of the goalposts, if you will. Because as you say, what the Majlis did this weekend, codifying the idea of executions for those who have been in the protest, putting trying to put this into law, as I said in, the, uh, in my essay at the top of the show today, this is the... Um, 
This is the plainest version of this regime showing who they are. There's no, there's no pretense at all anymore. You know, there's no, oh, she died from the gunfire of other protesters. Or, oh, the police had to respond because they were being attacked. This is a government, if we can call them that, literally saying, if you express any dissent, we're done with just detaining you and beating you and imprisoning you and psychologically tor- torturing you. We will execute you. What, what, what do you, as someone who has worked for years in this space, what, what do you make of this? You know, um, we face several times and during when, when I work in UN and Human Rights Council for some years, and um, I faced with lots of international people, which they came to UN and also international organizations, and they saw it more as a job, as not uh, as a human being who is defending the human rights and human rights concept. So in my op- opinion, if the international community, they would see what is going in Iran, they won't let Iran be part of the United Nations. They won't let Iran be part of the C- uh, CSW. And those things, I think Iran thinks, OK, I can do it. I can destroy the neighbor countries. I can interfere politically and a military in uh, other countries such as mm. Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and so on. So they saw they did it, and they went further and further. And then the people in the within the society, they don't have any weapon. They don't have any kind of um, defending themselves mm. uh, with uh, any kind of um, um, military way, how they uh, suppressing them. And they cannot defend. They, they are just going with the empty hands mm. and very democratic way. And they want the change. And they just killing them, easily killing them. And so nobody had any reaction. And they didn't make any special procedure to uh, follow the uh, regime and um, push them under pressure. And that's in, they, they can say, OK, we can also execute them. Why not? We can mm. also make a sentence for death penalty. Because he had a song. Another person um, just um, offered a chocolate in within the demonstration. Another young uh, student was part of the demonstration. They killed one person, Hadis Najafi, and then they went to the funeral, and then they shoot it on her sister. Yeah. Again, they killed Shirin um, uh, Ali Zade in Esfahan. They went there, and again, they uh, make a pressure on a family. And we have many other family members in Iran. They have fear to talk because they think if they don't talk, they would help their family members. Unfortunately, we have a huge suppression in the uh, Islamic regime of Iran, and they can do whatever they want to do because they don't see any consequence uh, on their actions. Can can I ask you, I mean, is is this partly about... uh, uh, that the UN, uh, the UNICEF, etc., are and and I, for, with apologies to the to the people who work in these organizations who actually do do so with a full heart, wanting to do do good work. But is it that these these institutions are just bullshit and they can't do anything, or they they're ineffective, or is does it have something to do with the fact that we are talking about Iran and the and the Middle East? Because because what I mean, what can we say about the impotence of international organizations like the UN or UNICEF? I've spoken about this in this space that that Iran is openly violating the UNICEF Charter on the Rights of the Child. That that by the way, Iran signed, uh, and the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And yet there has been seemingly little more than words so far. Is this because it's Iran, the Middle East? I've got to think that if this were happening in Dusseldorf or in Vancouver, the international community would be taking faster action, no? For sure. Um, you know, I had an um, experience, though, which I was really um, surprised because when I went to UN, I had the imagination I'm going to somewhere that they're really defending the human rights. I do, I'm not against that. So I said, okay, still is a good mechanism because we don't want to have a violation. We try to just go a democratic way to find a way. And I, still, I think this procedure can be better, can be a little bit more effective. Because r- right now, in my opinion, for some Western states, the life of one person as a Western people is not equal as a one of life of the Middle East right. people or the Eastern persons. Right. That's really sad because how we saw the international community, they reacted on a crime situation, specifically in, uh, within the Europe, also Germany. They don't have the same reaction on the situation of Iran. So 
my opinion, still maybe the uh, mindset of some people within the international community needs to change. And maybe also some members, they cannot have a reaction because they have a lot of policies, they need to be neutral. And I don't get how can you be ne neutral when you see the human rights violations and either if you have some effective role there, how you cannot react it. Everything goes very politically, but they really try to not intervene, uh, intervene, um, intervene uh, through the sovereignty of the countries. But this is not an effective mechanism. I can say it could be improved and we, can, we as a human being worldwide, we can also urge them and push them on pressure to change. As we saw in the last decades, UN itself has changed several times. Mm. It can be better again. Well, what is the point of these declarations? The Declaration on Human Rights or the Rights of the Child or, I mean, uh, I really don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what is the good of these things when, when faced with a situation where there's direct violations of various articles of these declarations, there's no action taken? It's difficult to defend UN when I have also uh, pointed on them and I have a problem with lots of the procedure in the United Nations. But uh, I can say still the declaration itself is good, but a lot of convention is exist, which uh, Iran and many other countries, um, they make a um, reservation on them. For example, they ratify the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of Children, but with the reservation. The, the reservation, how does it uh, define? It's defined like uh, we need to respect the law of the country. What does it mean? This is an Islamic law. That means Sharia. What does it mean? This is the age of the child as a maturity. That's mean nine years old for the uh, girls. So that's mean the girls from nine years old, they can marry. So such a regulation, how the United Nations can accept this kind of the paradox itself is a question. Yeah. How they can let a country ratify or sign such a convention and with all of those uh, reservations. So uh, for example, uh, regarding the CRPD uh, for the Convention on the Rights of uh, Persons with Disabilities, mm -hmm. they signed or ratified, but they are not implementing. So we need a most effective procedure to follow up the convention. This follow up procedure doesn't exist. I cannot say it doesn't exist, but it exists, but it's not efficient. Mm. And. Uh I, I, I'm guessing you've seen examples of this in other parts of the world. This isn't just unique to other parts of, the, say, the Middle East or uh, other parts of the the, the non-developed uh, world, or how, I'm not sure how we put it these days. You mean if we had some similar situation there? Yeah. The ineffectiveness of the UN when it comes to some places that are not the West, for example. If it's not, a, yeah, then some country is still, if they have some interest, like in Syria, maybe Afghanistan for a certain period of time, yeah, they had some uh, other um, uh, reflection, but Iran always was different for them. So uh, I used to work also for ICMPD, that's, uh, that was the International Center for Migration Development Policy, and this is an interest state. Um, I faced, for example, when I wrote about the um, refugees violations in Iran, refugees' right violations in Iran, they didn't prove it itself and they didn't publish the report they needed to send the report to iran and if iran is ratified and if iran is confirmed and accepted then they had right to uh, publish it so those such problems with international procedure and international organization or interested organization it, it has a really big question and i think this is our, our duty also to um talking about that, mm. uh, going and following up about this. This is all right. As part of all of these nations, for example, if I'm living at the moment in Germany, or if I'm a citizen of Italy, still I have a right to follow the situation or the rights of the persons in such a country. Yes. If I cannot collaborate with my own country, but still we can push on our Western states or Eastern states, wherever we are living, to follow up. For example, we had... Um, universal periodic review every country every four year four and a half years all member states they could comment on the human rights violations and the situation of those countries for example two times i was participated for the upr of iran and i think this is quite well and this is a quite good uh, procedure but this is pity because it's every four and a half year mm. i heard and uh, we heard i think also you heard about UN is going to have some special session on the human rights violation in Iran, and I'm really wondering what would be the reaction after after that, and uh, which kind of the resolution 
they would um, decide uh, for a uh, situation of Iran and um, which kind of mechanism they want to ac uh, actually um, um, accept it and also implementing for Iran. As an example, a special reporter for uh, human rights situation in Iran is exist since many years and they don't have a right to go and um, discover the human rights situation in Iran. So government say you are allowed to come, but with us. That means they cannot visit the uh, right. prisons. Right. They cannot interview the people. So this is really bullshit. And I don't yeah. know what they want to do, how they can make some right. effectiveness on this uh, mechanism. It's play acting. It's play acting. It's the, I mean, it's the same as signing these declarations and uh, ultimately not giving a shit about them. Let me uh, thank you so much for the time you're, you're giving us today. Let me ask you a final question, and I hope you'll come back because you're so uh, – it's, it's great to get this information from you. I, I know this is a difficult question in the sense that, I mean, uh, you, you know, you're just one person, but uh, you're not – you know, you're not, you're not Amnesty International yourself. But, but I, you've thought about this, and you've got – I'm sure you have suggestions. You posted yesterday um, on one of your social media platforms that we need immediate action from the international community. A lot of us are saying that. I'm not always sure exactly what we what we mean. What do you what do you have in mind? What would you like to see if you could snap your fingers and see it done? What would it be? That's mean urgent action. That means the governments of each country, which they have the ambassadors and consuls from Iran in their own country, they can follow up about the, um, uh, how they are existing in such a country, and they never ask them to come and talk about the mass human rights violation why they need to have the embassies in the, uh, such country and they are flying uh, easily to the western states their kids they have the visa they can have a permanent permission of stay in countries such as canada swiss and many other countries and uh, germany for example germany as an example has one of the best economical um, business with iran and many people belong to irgc they have the offices in the different cities of the um, Germany, such as um, Dusseldorf, Hamburg, and uh, um, so on. So they need to make effective action. Mm -hmm. What are they doing here? This money, which is belongs to the people, and they uh, transfer to the um, banks of the Western countries. Why they are not blocking? Why they are not making clarification? Unfortunately, we saw after this kind of the agreement from the European Union. Switzerland doesn't accept it to make these uh, sanctions on Iran. So <laughs> this is very funny. Mm. They are kind of the um, part of uh, some international community, such as European Union, but individual countries, they can decide. They don't want to go in wow. because they have very good business. Uh, wow. um, uh, yeah, business relationship with Iran and Iranian uh, governments. So um, for me, it's a big question. Then what is the legitimacy of those uh, international organizations, how we can believe such a definition, what they created for us as a human rights and human rights values, does it exist? And why they are not making any, um, any procedure on these mass mm. violations in Iran? I think any kind of the um, special rapporteurs on torture or committee mm. or um, a special bodies in uh, international community, they can see what is going in the uh, United, uh, uh, actually in uh, Islamic regime of Iran since um, uh, um, actually after a uh, revolution till now and uh, in all last decades and currently what is going on. These mass human rights violations need to be looked from the international community and they see this is a revolution. They cannot change with words. People within the country, they say this is a revolution and they cannot name it differently because they want to be politically and they want to be nice with the Iranian regime. I will say that this is sometimes some people ask, um, perhaps cynically, perhaps they're just realistic, I don't know, ask, well, what, what, what do these protests, these demonstrations, these rallies that you guys are having outside of Iran, what do they really do? Uh, on the one hand, we've heard from people inside Iran that it really makes a difference to them in terms of their their energy and their recognizing that there's support out there and 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 love, etc. But on the other hand, it really does seem like this can be a way to to push our own governments. Um, you know, we've seen it here in Canada. There's still a ways to go, but in the first few weeks, the government of Canada really wasn't doing that much, wasn't responding that much to what's what's happening in Iran. And there's so many people out on the streets. There's so much, you know, the, the, the voices were so loud that 
uh, I feel like the Canadian government, I mean, now our prime minister is walking uh, on the street alongside Hamza Ismailoun in a, in a in a rally. That's perhaps what we have to do to keep the pressure on in a situation like you talk about in Switzerland. Um, I, I don't know, but uh, th- this is one way that people power can make a difference. Can I just ask you if if you if you know what what would be? I don't disagree with anything you said, of course, in terms of. Um, calling back the ambassadors closing the embassies trying to close off those block the, the 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 money that goes to 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 benefactors outside of iran um what would be the result of that kind of isolation for this regime how do you see it really actually playing out let's say all of let's say that happens let's say all of those european countries and more agree to do exactly what you've just said what happens then Let's be frankly, um, uh, European Union, a lot of uh, Western states, they decided for this sanction in the past years. They did the sanction, but they used still the petrol from Iran. They bought it from the uh, gray markets. They uh, could buy it from the neighbor countries. They knew this is comes from Iran. We have a uh, lots of reports, which is belongs to lots of those Western states. Still, they had the economic uh, businesses with Iran. And I'm wondering, such a sanction is make a huge mess on the life of the ordinary people in, in the country. It doesn't make any kind of effect on politicians. And they get easily visa to politicians. They can travel, they can invest, they can have a businesses uh, abroad. They can go on and in Germany, in last 10 days, if I'm not wrong, it was the last week in the last two weeks, after the um, huge demonstration in Berlin, they attacked in front of the embassy of Iran for the demonstrants, we, uh, which they stayed there, five people with the knives. They attacked them and they had no reaction. We need safety. How they can let Iranian people be also abroad, suppressing inside the country, outside the country. We cannot, uh, we are not allowed to go into our home countries and they can go wherever they want to go. So this kind of uh, isolation for long term is affecting on the life of the people which is also living in the Iran. So it's not just economically, but also politically on those politicians, which is in Iran and they have the businesses abroad and they can just say, yeah, we want the death penalty for the, uh, our ordinary people because they had a protest. They didn't do anything wrongly and they can kill them. And they not being really, it's very hard to express my feeling, but mm. this is really mass feeling because we, we just think, okay, what could be the position of the international community in this way? Just letting them, having the negotiating with right. them, right. just uh, chilling out and going and so, so on. And it was uh, some reports is uh, some company like Abar Arvan in Dusseldorf is helped Iranian government to make the filtering for Iranian people. Mm. So how Germany close their eyes. How is possible the German government doesn't know what is going on here and they gave them the company. They invest here, they have their own people in the city of the Dusseldorf and they are making filtering for the ordinary people in Iran. So that's the things I think the Western states, they need to make some clear uh, position and uh, show where they stand. Is it with Iranian people or is it with the Iranian regime? Paris, too, I really appreciate the time you've given us and your and your wisdom. It's really appreciated. Thank you for doing this. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. The breath of the morning I keep forgetting The smell of the warm summer air I live in a town Where you can't smell a thing You watch your feet this is a special edition of Rook, episode 213, The Uprising. Is an Iranian life worth the same as a Western one? Let us go to Washington, D.C. next. Cameron Khonsarinia is the policy director for the National Union for Democracy in Iran, NUFTI, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of the Iranian American community raising awareness about the freedom movements in Iran. Uh, Nuf D. Cameron heads research, writing, legislative efforts, media relations, and special projects. He's been a pretty regular presence in media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Political Europe, and Newsweek, where he has written on Iran and U.S. foreign policy. And right now, Cameron Khan Sarinia joins me from Washington, D.C. Hello, sir. 
Jian. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be with you and uh, the entire Rook team. Thanks for doing this. It's nice to have you on the program. You know, you you posted something not too long ago, or maybe it was a tweet, I can't remember, but you said um, you, you were responding to what Iranians have had to deal with in the last 43, 44 years, and you said, this soon the pain will end, and um, to which you, you sounded quite convinced. Are you? I am convinced. I think, um, you know, Jean, probably for you, for your team, for for the Rook audience, um, just like for, for all Iranian Americans, Iranians in the diaspora, um, not not as much, of course, as Iranians inside the country, but it's been an extremely um, emotional, oftentimes painful, eight weeks of this revolution. It's, it's been even more painful and emotional, forty three years. Um, but I'm 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 very convinced that that this will end. I mean, for those who know about Iran's history, you know, this this really quite illustrious. Sometimes we can get a bit uh, chauvinistic about our history, but I think there's a lot to be uh, proud of. There's so much to be proud of. And for those who, who know anything about our, our 2,500 years of history know um, that there's been a lot of ups and downs uh, in Iran's history. There's been a lot of invasions. There's been a lot of uh, abuse. There's been a lot of despots. Um, but each and every time, uh, and I think backed by and rooted in our, our culture, our traditions, our heritage, uh, Iran has risen above that. Iranians have survived that. And, and I have no doubt um, that this time, uh, 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 up, uh, up against not a foreign invader, but a domestic invader, in my view, uh, Iran and the Iranian people uh, will succeed and, and that pain will finally end. If it is a revolution, how do you, um, and I believe it is as well, but but how do we mitigate um, it going wrong somehow? You you also made a statement recently where you said um, you sense the youth of today, quote unquote, will not make the mistake their parents did, um, as you said, uh, in letting this revolution be co-opted by one group like it was by the mullahs ultimately in 1979 and thereafter. Um, h- how do you sense that the, the youth of today will will be able to pull that off? Well, you know, the Islamic Republic has imposed so many costs on the Iranian people. Um, be the, first and foremost, of course, of, of course, Iranians inside, but the diaspora, those who have been forced to flee the country, executions, jailings, I mean, all the things that, that we all know about and have been forced to live with for the past four decades. Um, but one, if, if I can call it a silver lining, one benefit, one thing that has come out of this torturous, devastating, destructive experience uh, that we call the Islamic Republic has been that the Iranian people have come to know very well the cost of uh, ideological regimes. They've come to know very well the cost uh, of, of governments, of regimes, of people uh, who sell them a bill of goods um, and who try to uh, you know, bring everyone uh, together under some, some false flag and, and, and really a bunch of lies, which I think what is, is what we all recognize now 1979 was. Um, and because of that, that memory being so fresh uh, and the costs of that being so real, um, I think Iranians won't make that mistake again. Uh, it, it came at a very heavy cost, um, but that is one benefit um, that, that I think we will see going forward. Uh, 1979, I think uh, the parents, if not the grandparents of today's uh, generation on the street, um, were fooled. I think they, they admit that themselves. Um, they were sold a bill of goods, and uh, it was a revolution led by Islamist and communist uh, or Marxist forces, uh, this famous um, that, that came together. Um, and I think now Iranians will not be fooled uh, by, by any ideology. Um, there's lots trying, um, as, as I think we all know, but I think that, that as I said earlier, rooted in, in their history, rooted in their uh, their patriotism, rooted in their love of Iran and love of one another uh, as Iranians, above all else, mm. uh, they'll be able to to not be sold that same bill of goods or a different bill of goods this time. Um, so I, I'm very confident, and I think that a reason for that confidence is the quite unfortunate cost um, that the Iranian people have been forced to pay over the past 43 years. Right, right. I, I mean, it is something, uh, I'll be honest, It does. it does worry me. We've talked about it on this show before. And I never know how 
how soon is too soon to talk about this. But I mean, even going on the demonstrations of which there have been many here in Toronto, uh, there weren't so many in Istanbul where I've been for the last week, but, but here in Toronto, probably been to at least uh, 15 of them and, and there's a certain pride almost in walking alongside well, there's a guy holding a Reza Shah poster there's somebody who uh, is a, a leftist leftist of some kind there's there's even the communist and we're all walking together and we're we want the end of this regime but there's a little part niggling at me going okay well um, so then, <laughs> um, uh, and I don't know if that same diversity or, or concern is happening inside Iran, but then what happens? There has to be at some point some coming together where, um, you know, one of these groups that certainly doesn't respond, uh, re- represent the majority of those who are demonstrating, doesn't co opt this, doesn't somehow take advantage of it, exploit it, or take power somehow. Uh, how, how soon is too soon to worry about that? I, I, it, it's it's never too soon uh, too soon to be worried about these things. I think uh, uh, you know the the antennas always have to be up, and we always have to be concerned about that. But I think that we can actively prevent that. Whether that's something that let's just talk about that the diaspora first, because I think that's actually uh, where the focus needs to be more in, in this regard, as opposed to inside. I think people inside Iran are are so remarkably united. I mean, there, there have been attempts uh, by those in the international press, for example. Um, to say that you know ethnic tensions are being stoked in Iran, but what we see inside Iran uh, is is just the opposite of that. I mean, we yeah. see in Kurdistan province and Sistan Baluchistan province and in provinces uh, along Iran's borders uh, the same slogans being chanted in Tehran or in Karaj or in Shiraz uh, or, or other parts of the country. In fact, they're chanting to one another in different provinces, uh, saying unity, unity, etihad, etihad. Uh, or, you know, Zahedan, Zahedan, Cheshmon, Cherave, Zahedan, you're Iran's guiding light. Yeah. You know, so, so those who have tried to sow division inside uh, have been so unsuccessful because the Iranian people have said what matters first and foremost to us is Iran and our identity as Iranians. I um, mean, haven't allowed sort of these, these forces that would try to sow division, be it uh, so, quote unquote ethnic or otherwise. That's, that's been a total failure in my view. But looking at the diaspora, I think it's we have to to focus on what unites us. And I think that's a few things, and, th- and they're quite simple, and those who are unwilling to accept this um, are sort of raising their hands to say, you know, hey, nice to meet you. I'm the, I'm the source of disunity, uh, uh, and, 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 that this, and this is why. And I think that, you know, those things are simple. The first uh, is that it, uh, is Iran's territorial integrity. We all believe in Iran's borders uh, as they are, uh, and respect them and, and respect Iran's culture and tradition uh, uh, and, and the beautiful diversity, uh, be it linguistic or, or otherwise, that we have within those borders. The second uh, is that Iran should be a secular democracy. There, there mm-hmm. should be the separation of, of mosque and state, church and state, temple and state. We have so, so many uh, beautiful religions in Iran. Um, and there should be a democratic system. Uh, and, and third, that the future form of government should be decided by the Iranian people. I mean, these are some pretty basic, in, 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 you know, a direct election. These are some pretty basic things. I think if you find people disagreeing with those, then those are those are the ones who are who are sort of sowing discord. And I think that the vast majority of Iranians, be they inside the country or outside, would agree to those principles. And so I, I'm I'm less concerned, to be honest with you, Jean, about um, division or disunity. Mm-hmm. I think. You, you see that a lot on, on Twitter, especially. Oh, there's disunity in the diaspora. I've never seen that. And I don't know about you. Maybe you can share your thoughts. I've never seen the diaspora, at least I can speak for the Iranian-American community, as united as we are today, as united on these on these principles, as united under the, the Iranian flag, the Shiro Khorshi flag. I mean, the unity that we're seeing is, is in my view, incomparable to mm-hmm. anything we've mm-hmm. had thus far. So, I'm not worried, but to your point, it's it's always good to, to, to think as of now even of these principles that unite us, um, which can serve uh, as a basis for collaboration, for working together, um, and, and to be sort of a, a, a defense mechanism against those forces that would try to sow division going forward. Yeah, I know. I do agree with you in, in terms of the unity and, 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 and unity slash pride. I mean, that... Um, uh, 
uh, as we've talked about on this program, that that shot of the 100,000 100, people in Berlin, um, just looking at that made me cry. And uh, and uh, why am I looking at why why looking at looking at a photo that's in Berlin? Why is this making me cry? And it's because this catharsis of of my whole life being not seeing that and and not seeing that kind of pride, uh, especially in the diaspora and that kind of unity. At the same time. You know, we do have a bit of a tall poppy syndrome thing where somebody who um, sticks out and, and, and is and is doing good work, perhaps, you know, uh, in, in kind of bringing people along, suddenly gets attacked on social media by other Iranians, you know, uh, not this guy, not this woman, we don't like her, you know. And so there's a little bit of concern about that, you know. I mean, uh, the, collecting, the collective decision-making uh, um, um elements of that let me let, let me ask you then the same sort of question around when is too soon around leadership because uh we haven't talked a lot a lot about it on this show and partly because to be honest we, we were doing this series where we were actually talking to people on the front lines young people young women young men on the front lines of the demonstrations in iran and they um quite regularly were saying this is a leaderless revolution and we don't want to get caught up in that we're enjoying the fact that this isn't this doesn't have somebody trying to organize this like a math equation like you your previous generations tried to and i want to respect that and at the same time uh, at some point there's going to need to be some kind of organization there's going to be going to need to be some sort of sort of leadership even if it's uh, a pathway towards democratic elections to actually choose the leadership that should come from within iran so how how do we address the the leadership paradox um in a leaderless revolution it, it, it's a really great question john i think it's something that so so many of us are, are, are thinking about and again i i just share with you my my personal opinion nufti as you know um is an iranian american organization where we're a civic organization working to engage and mobilize iranian americans uh, to, to make an impact here in Washington, D.C. On, on policy and the media to be a voice for the Iranian people. So we, we're not an opposition group. You know, we're not vying to or trying to be part of any coalition or, you know, shura or counselor. That's, that's not our, our place. Our place is to, to work within the Iranian-American diaspora. But just my, my personal opinion on this is someone who sort of follows this is, and maybe this is controversial or something that is sort of going against the grain of what one sees on Twitter every day or the conventional wisdom. I'm, I'm not convinced that we necessarily need this, you know, this council that everyone sort of is, not everyone, but so many people are talking about it. Well, let's, let's get these five uh, men and women together or these 10 men and women, sometimes it's different numbers and different names and have them sit down and they'll be our representatives. And I, maybe, maybe that's a good idea, but maybe it's not. Um, you know, I think that 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 hasn't been a model that is that has proved itself effective. Sorry, just to, to just to clarify, this is the um, coalition that would include uh, uh, Masi Elinijad and Shirin Ebadi and Hamid Ismailoun and Reza Pahlavi and a, a few people coming together in a room to be the the wise council in the diaspora. Well, w whether it's those five, whether it's ten, whether it's three, you know, there's 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 a, there's a bunch of different ideas floating around. Right. Um, and I think for, for I think. Before we get to something like that, let's say we even need to ever, or it's even advisable to ever get to such a position, which again, I'm not necessarily convinced of in my personal opinion. I think we have to start at, at, a, at a even, I want to say lower bar, which is let's have everyone in the diaspora and, and, you know, all of, and urge those folks who, who are leaders in the opposition. I think some of them, for example, certainly Reza Pahlavi, I think, you know, is, is already doing this. But urge people to to support each other, to as opposed to just in name of hey we're we're this revolutionary council to show in action that that people are supporting each other. For example, when when you know when our friend Nazani Bonyadi goes to to speak really on, on behalf of each and every one of us, I think she was basically Iran's ambassador at the UN for yeah. the first time in forty three years. We had a representative at the UN, and it was it was you talk about you know tears coming to your eyes. It was so inspiring. For me, to see Nazanin uh, um, in that room talk on behalf of, of 87 million Iranians and, and, of course, all of us in the diaspora as well, you know, we need, we need everyone to come out and, and publicly say, Nazanin, you're, you're doing a great job. Thank you for what you're doing and, and, and support her. And, you know, when, when whoever else, when Ali Karimi does something great or any of these folks, when, when, they, when they 
do something that is advancing this movement, advancing this revolution, if you want to call it that, which I think everyone is now calling it probably rightly. Before we talk about who's sitting next to who at some council that may or may not exist, we, we need to practice that mm. unity, I think. Just, just calling something unity or just uh, you know, getting together uh, for the sake of it is, is, in my opinion, less valuable than showing that unity in practice mm. and and saying, you know, damn it, Gam, you know, Rafi and Korokad, you know, you're you're fantastic. You know, this was really great when he went and had that speech, or you know, promoting each other. I think we've got to show it in practice first. And I think we've the Islamic Republic has for so long tried to divide each other, uh, divide uh, people from one another, to divide the community inside Iran, outside Iran, and and so I think the the best response to them is not in name. Uh, of unity, but in the practice of unity, mm. I think we're we're moving towards that, uh, and the more we see of it, uh, the better. I appreciate that response. Um, you're you're in D.C. You're in Washington D.C. Tomorrow is midterm elections in the U.S. Uh, in general, how, how effective do you feel Iranians have been in the diaspora in trying to get the representatives of our respective governments, say in the U.S. or Canada or the U.K. Uh, to take a stand on Iran. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to maybe not do the typical uh, American thing, but I'm going to say, you know, what a great job you guys have done in Canada. Uh, and I think that you know we're always trying to keep keep our Canadian brothers and sisters to the north down. But if we're being fair, you guys have done a fantastic job. I think the Iranian diaspora in Canada, whether it's the the, the huge march um, that you all had to to the consistent. Uh, efforts of the PS752 families to, to you know, my friend Kaveh Shahrus, to so many others. Uh, you guys have just done an amazing job. So really kudos and, and thanks um, to all of you. Yeah, and, 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 I, I, and I was just saying in, a, in the previous <laughs> chat with uh, Paris 2 in Dusseldorf that that I really think in, in the case of Canada, it really was people pressure that has moved the government along. I, I don't know if you, you may know this, if you know Kaveh and others, that that the, the, the government was kind of, um, you know, uh, wringing his hands, not not doing much, uh, and and now, of course, the prime minister is is you know walking in the rally alongside uh, Hamid Ismaili, and so so there's been the goalposts have been moved, and I do think that that's people pressure. I do think that that's an example of what can happen when there's thousands of people in the streets, and and a politician kind of goes, I mean, even if their heart's in the right place, also goes, oh, this is this is good business for me to to get on side this. I, I'm not sure I've seen that as much in the in the U.S. Yes, um, but I didn't mean to cut well, you off. You go ahead and tell me. No, it's, well, I, I think you're exactly right about Canada. There's no question in my mind that it was because of the uh, you know Canadian Iranian community, the diaspora in Canada, that that we've seen these um, these policy shifts. Whether it's the listing of the ten thousand uh, personnel, whether it's you know uh, Prime Minister Trudeau going to rallies, whether it's the really excellent speeches we've seen on the, on the floors of the Commons, um, it's it's been. Less so in America. I think it's actually much more difficult in America, of course. But I will say, we've seen really immense progress. You know, uh, up until about eight weeks ago, you know, the mission of our job every day when we walk into this office in Nufi was to mobilize people to convince elected officials, the media, folks at think tanks, public intellectuals, that the only way to solve the problems that America faces with Iran is for Iran not to be under the occupation of the Islamic Republic, mm. for, for the Iranian people to be free and have a normal, secular, democratic government. For the past eight weeks, we haven't had to make that argument. People have accepted that. There's been this fundamental paradigm shift um, in Washington. And, of course, you know, the, the MVP of winning that game has been the people of Iran on the streets who have led with such, um, such immense courage and bravery that has forced... Uh, policymakers to take, take advantage. And I think the assist here in Washington has come from the Iranian American community, from the diaspora. We talk to, to folks on Capitol Hill every day, whether they're Congress people or senators or their staffers, more importantly, who are telling us that they have never, they have never in the time that they've been on the Hill, be they as members or as staffers, received this much communication uh, from the Iranian American community. I mean, the past two months, uh, their their phones have been uh, overrun, their email inboxes overflowed with with calls, with messages from Iranian Americans, particularly, of course, in California, where we have a huge uh, base of our mm. community 
in states like Texas and Florida and New York, all across the country. Uh, so I think in, in Canada, it's, it's come with some much more tangible results, um, perhaps um, because I think Canada was behind the United States in some of its policies, uh, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the IRGC yeah. and, and elsewhere. Yeah. So that yeah. allowed it to sort of make take these more um, noticeable policy moves. Yeah. Um, but in the United States, I think we, we've had immense uh, immense activity from the Iranian American community, people calling their members, writing, and that's that's I think been uh, uh, the cause of a significant shift. And we see for the first time Secretary Blinken meeting with leading uh, Iranian American dissidents again. I go back to our friend Nazanin Bonya, the Roya Hakakian, uh, other amazing Iranian American uh, women who, who were meeting with them. You know, Nazanin met with the vice president. I mean, I think this is again first and foremost because of the Iranian people. Uh, but coming in, and secondly, with the assist uh, from the Iranian diaspora here in the States. Let me ask you, Cameron, about um, misinformation or disinformation coming out, um, coming from, from Iran. I mean, we know that... Um, we can't <laughs> we can't depend, depend on uh, Iranian state media for uh, information, uh, and we know that there's um, trouble in terms of uh, access. Uh, sometimes what what's happening on the streets exactly? Um, we don't even know the exact numbers of how many people have been murdered in the last few weeks uh, by this regime. Um, but also, you suggested um, that even within the Western media. Um, we are not getting the information as um, as correctly as we should be or as, as in a balanced way. I mean, for example, you've said there's a lot of evidence of pro-Pahlavi support in Iran. Uh, I guess this would be pro-Reza Pahlavi support, etc. Uh, and that that's being suppressed in the Western media. Who would be doing that and why? You know, I don't know if it's if it's being suppressed. I think it maybe it is. I don't know if there's necessarily this uh, anti-nationalist or anti-Pahlavi force somewhere in the in the Western media controlling things. Maybe I, I don't know, but I think certainly there's an there's an internalized um, bias. You know, actually, we talk about that a lot in the West these days. You know, our our our, uh, our natural biases, our internalized biases that we all have. I think that's you see that a lot in, in the Western media. I think the reason is probably it's very difficult for a producer, a writer, uh, an anchor in a Western news program to, after really decades of um, the Islamic Republic's propaganda um, in favor of itself and against the previous government, against uh, the Pahlavi dynasty, uh, even really against Iran's history and, and traditions. I think it's difficult for those folks in the media to understand and to comprehend it and really even to believe that Iranians, not all of them, um, but a great number, would look to Iran's past and mm. see Iran's future. Mm. Um, not necessarily with, uh, you know, I'm certainly many support the restoration of the monarchy, but not all, not all do. But even those who don't, um, I think, look to the pre-1979 period as one uh, where Iran's passport was respected internationally, where Iran was a place to do business, where Iran was a place to travel, where Iranians were respected, uh, where Iran was sending foreign aid to developing countries. Iran was establishing good relations at the same time mm. with the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, with the Arabs and the Israelis, with Pakistan and with India, with the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, there's very few countries, if any, who were playing that role at the time. Um, so it's no surprise that I think Iranians look to that period for inspiration for their future. And uh, we have this, this this consistent refrain, I'm sure you've heard it, any of, any of us in the diaspora have, chi budim, chi uh, I think people feel that very intensely in Iran very often. But it's difficult, I think, for a Western audience to understand it because they've been imbibed with so much propaganda. The Shah was a dictator. The Shah was bloodthirsty. The Shah was a puppet. I mean, all of this really, you know, the original fake news, if you will. Um, it's difficult for them to put all of that misinformation aside and to accept that so many people look um, to to the Pahlavis mm -hmm. or to Reza Pahlavi. Um, again, some certainly look to him as as a political leader. Um, many do. I th I think an even greater number look at him and his family with with respect and appreciation for what they had uh, built for iran 
um, and, and, and simply as, as a symbol and as a representation of, of what Iran could be, vibrant, modern, um, you know, uh, respected, um, democratic, um, secular. Um, so I, I think that's what Iranians see, but, but I, under, I understand for Westerners why that's difficult um, to understand. But more broadly, the last point I'll make on this is this, this misinformation or this lack of understanding of Iran doesn't just apply to this particular example of, of let's say, Iran's pre-1979 history or, or to Reza yeah, Pahlavi. Yeah, yeah. Um, but more broadly, we have almost this, this reverse Orientalism, or if it's not just actual Orientalism, where people who have been think tanks for decades uh, or who have the, the prestigious writing jobs at the fancy uh, academic journals or magazines think they know more about Iran than Iranians do yeah, or than yeah. the Iranian diaspora do. Yeah. And that's a very consistent theme. And, and uh, it's, of course, so insulting to all of us, not only because it's so off the mark yeah. from what's happening in Iran, but it really is a form of, if not soft, overt racism to say, yeah, you guys don't really know what you're talking about. You know, it's your own country, it's your well, own it's, people. Let yeah. us tell you what's uh, going on. A hundred percent I on that last point, I think. And it's steeped in in a, a notion of what Iran and the Middle East was that they haven't caught up yet. There's it's still they're thinking, you know, um, they're, they're years behind. First of all, I, I think maybe another way of saying uh, not that I'm suggesting to you that to how to how to how to affect the way you say these things, but I, but but maybe another way of saying it is is uh, in terms of the piece about pre 1979, etc., is that Iranians have necessarily some Iranians, maybe many, maybe a majority, have necessarily um, evolved in their thinking around what that revol that that other revolution, the 1971 one was about, and whether it was whether it should have happened and whether and how mistakes were made and how expectations uh, have changed and shouldn't have been there. And they've had 43 years of being traumatized to, to think, of, think on that and go, fuck, you know, what did we do, right? Um, whereas the average Western media person it, you're absolutely right. It's still reading the script from, from uh, okay, there was a dictator, they got rid of him, and then this Islamic Republic came, etc. So that evolution hasn't happened. But even further than that, in, in terms of what you were just saying, I was speaking to somebody in Istanbul three or four days ago, a former journalist who's a professor there now, and she was saying something quite profound exactly on this point of there's still a notion of Iran and the Middle East as the victims, as this turbulent area, kind of backward, et cetera, that even so-called progressive journalists, et cetera, in the West have about Iran. And so everything gets seen through that prism, the same way we might stereotype Africa as they're all living in famine or something like that. And so they can't believe that, uh, how is it that these young women are so modern and they're leading this revolution? Or how is it that, you know, these guys are as organized as they are? Or that uh, because it doesn't fit into that that mold that they're so used to thinking of the Middle East in. Does that make sense to you? It, it, I think that's 100% right. And, you know, not not, not to get into to the controversial topics, but I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not even going to express an opinion on the issue, but just an example of exactly your point. Obviously, one of the most common things these sort of Western intellectuals that, that we're talking about cite is 1953. And, and, and you, by the way, have had some fascinating programs on this with, with Dr. Milani and others, uh, who, who I respect immensely. Uh, I think it's done probably the best work on, on the subject. Um, you know, when they when they say 1953 again, whatever your opinion is on on that matter, and and I think it's one for history to decide, not for us to debate um, today. Um, it's 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 om it's taking away Iranians' agency. In to my to me, they're saying, look, X event is happening today. It's because of 1953. Effectively, what they're saying is. These Iranians are angry, you know, people who live in the sand and they have no uh, thoughtfulness, they have no self-awareness, they have no ability to make thoughtful decisions uh, today based on their current political realities and their lives. They're still angry about something that happened 70 years ago. I mean, that's that's basically an F you to the Iranian people. Mm. You, you guys can't think clearly. You're still angry about something that happened all this time ago. And, and that's just one example. Uh, it happens so consistently uh, and and the way you put it is is exactly right they can't imagine 
that Iranians have this political sophistication, this political development um, that 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 they do, uh, and they assume that that everything is well, you know, it's got to be the West. Well, it's, it's everything is not about the West. Everything is not about the United States. Everything right. is not about Donald Trump or sanctions or 1953 or you know I, George Bush's war on terror. I don't know. Uh, these are, are independent events. So what's happening right. in Iran? Uh, is because of 43 years of gender apartheid, of torture, right. of abuse, of killing, of rape, of subjugation, of an entire nation. Right. Um, and I assure the Western intellectuals and academics and writers that they can describe what's going on in Iran without having to uh, use some reference to the West or something. Because that's that's not the it's reason for a, any of this happening. Such a, it's such a good point, you know. And those of us who are especially... Uh, you know, I, but my my major was poli sci history. I mean, we we like to dissect these things and come up with our theories. When I'm speaking to um, you know Azadeh and Mashad a couple of weeks ago, uh, who's been on the front lines of the protests and, and wanted to use her real name, you know, did this is who I am. I'm not afraid. Uh, you know, young a young person who's on the front line. She she wants to be able to play her guitar and wear what she wants and um, is fed up and uh, really fed up and and is also fed up with the how her parents and previous generations didn't deal with this and didn't realize that reform wasn't going to work with this regime etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. she's she she didn't once mention you know back in 53 <laughs> or 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 all the other things you know or or uh, I, I mean and, and for sure there may be somebody some folks who have that kind of scope who are involved in this as well but but this is like a a war for freedom uh and and you're right it's um it's perhaps a little reductive to expect that this is all based on or in some ways even insulting to 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 suggest this is all based on uh, things that happened decades ago and and come up and um a, f a final question to you thank you for your time today by the way uh what action should do you believe we should be taking uh in the in the diaspora this is the circumstances i.e that we can control um what action should we be taking with respect to the international community and and getting something done um and and should we even care about the un uh, at this point that seems so impotent or should we be directing our our ideas somewhere else to the UN, um, first of all, I think that you know, I, I generally share your view <laughs> that the UN is is quite impotent, but it, it can be used um, as a platform in incredibly powerful ways, as we saw um, Nazani do, uh, Nazani Bonyadi do last week. I mean that, and we already talked about it. I don't want to, um, you know, <laughs> overhit the point, but that was really historic. Uh, the the fact that we had somebody go on our behalf and, and, and use the floor of the United Nations for 10 minutes mm. to talk mm. about not only what's going on in Iran, but to the previous point we were just discussing, what the Iranian people want, what they're experiencing, mm. what they're demanding, um, was but, unprecedented. But, but, but Cameron, and you're 100% right, props to Nazanin, who's Baniadi, who's been amazing. But so far, as of this moment, anyway, maybe this changes tonight, right yeah. before we post, I don't know, zero resolutions zero emergency sessions, zero commissions of inquiry, like basically nothing, right? So, so the, the, and, and that goes back to your point of the UN in action being impotent. However, having Nazanin sit there right next to the US ambassador to the UN, right in front of all these delegations, I think can serve as a very important platform for these countries who were there in this session to go back to their own countries and to to uh, to put into place policies, to enact legislation for their executives, uh, to take policy decisions and make policy directives that would benefit the Iranian people. So, I personally, I have very little faith that the UN will take action. Mm. But the use of the UN, as I said, as a symbolic tool uh, to inspire action at the country mm. level is significant. And then this comes back to the role of that of the diaspora, which was your question, yes. which I, I slayed slightly, I slayed slightly from. I, I apologize. We need to in the diaspora. We uh, here in the United States, you know, folks in Canada, all across Europe, in Australia, elsewhere, can be doing, in my view, one of two broad things. The first of which is, let's just call it legislative, or, or as, it in, as it involves um, the government. You mentioned, um, you know, previously in the program, these hundreds 
of members of, of the Islamic parliament uh, who voted uh, or expressed their favor uh, for using the death penalty mm. against Iranian protesters. Many people have been writing about this over the past few days, and it's time to put it into action. And it's something that we're working on here uh, at Mufti in Washington. Each and every one of those people needs to be put on the sanctions list of the respective countries in which the Iranian diaspora have a voice. Each and every one of the local, of the provincial, of the national uh, police forces, of the SEPA, uh, of, of, of any other uh, security apparatus in uh, Iran that are involved in uh, the oppression of the Iranian people need to be identified, uh, which I know the human rights groups are working uh, basically night and day on, and they need to put on the sanctions list. And then we need to get into not only putting pressure on this regime and holding the regime accountable, but methods of actually supporting the Iranian people. I know you followed a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, methods, uh, Gianna, things we're working on here and so many other groups are working on, but supporting Iranian mm -hmm. uh, strikers and workers, uh, supporting Iranians with access um, to internet. So I think the diaspora needs to push and lobby for those efforts in their respective countries. And then the second part, which, which I think the diaspora has done a fantastic job of, and sometimes we run the risk of taking for granted and viewing it as, as insignificant, mm. but it's, it's the public diplomacy. It's talking about what's happening in Iran. The fact that Maxwell Amini in English version is one of the most used hashtags in the world over the past two months is significant. Um, we have to continue doing that. We have to bring what's happening in Iran and the Iranian people's demands and desires to uh, to our communities, uh, whether it's even just our friends and family members, people who you may not think have significant influence. But that, that reverberation effect, the network effect of having more and more people talking about this is significant. And it can come in many ways, shapes and forms. Sometimes it's just social mm -hmm. media. Sometimes it's, for example... You know this uh, this gallery exhibit that that Mufti is working with a team of Iranian American female designers called Iran Rising to show uh, Iranian protest art. It's going to be you know free and open to the public for two days here in Georgetown and Washington mm. D.C. November nineteenth and twentieth. You know showing the creativity of Iranian artists and how they're reflecting the the aspirations and desires of Iranian protesters. You know that's that's one way of doing it through art. Our musicians have done it uh, in so many other excellent ways through art. So this public diplomacy, this communication, we've done such a good job at, at it, I think. But we can't take it for granted. We have to keep doing it. Uh, and that's the second component to this sort of actual diplomacy or, 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 or legislative efforts uh, that I think we need to, to redouble our efforts on here in every country that the diaspora uh, is active in. This is such a great answer that I hate to um, not end on that note because it's so well said. But but if I if if I just want, for my own sake, uh, and forgive me if I'm too simple, I don't. I, I want to work it through. I want to make sure I'm clear about it. Um, when we put those those folks in the uh, majlis, those so-called representatives of the Iranian people who uh, voted for or advocated for this uh, the execution of people for for. Um, for simply protesting, et cetera. When we sanction them, um, what 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 exactly does that mean? Like what what how does that how does that hurt them? I want to know. I want to know how how it how how it's going to hit them hard. You know. So it would depend on on which country is sanctioned and and under what sanction authority they're being sanctioned. So of course, many people know about the Magnitsky Act sanction, but there are in the United States. Let's just say where I'm slightly more familiar with, with sanctions law, uh, there are many examples of sanctions. There are human rights sanctions, terrorism sanctions, et cetera. And so each of them has uh, their own uh, uh, sort of associated, um, uh, I don't want to say punishment, but their associated um, uh, limitations on that person. Sometimes it's travel bans, them not being able to travel uh, to these countries. I think something like that, for example, in Canada would be particularly beneficial mm. where we know that you know, so many members of the regime's, uh, you know, sort of leading um, institutions or their family members and associates have sort of, you know, gone to Canada, stashed away money, made uh, hideouts for themselves, All basically. Right. So sometimes it's travel limitations. Sometimes it's freezes on their assets. Um, sometimes it's a combination of it. So it can take a variety of forms. It would, de it would depend on what particular sanction authority uh, they would be sanctioned under. Uh, and so I don't want to advocate a particular authority here because the experts would, would have to look at that. Uh, but I think in each country, uh, it, it may take a different form. And, and, and those would impo impose a serious cost uh, because 
For example, when we, when we talk about sanctioning, let's say, Ali Khamenei, uh, the retort is often, well, Khamenei doesn't travel outside the country right. except, you know, what a few times. Once to North care? Korea, he's, right. he's, he's not going to be spending summer, you know, uh, in Vancouver, right. um, which is, is fine. But for members of the Majlis, who are hundreds of members, uh, many of them have probably spent significant time in the West. Mm. Uh, their children certainly do. Their family members certainly are. So that would be a significant cost. I- indeed, much more on them, I would, I would think, than, for example, somebody like uh, Ali Khamenei. It's really helpful. It's really, really, really good to talk to you. Thank you for making the time. Thanks for doing this today. I look forward to more. Take care, Cameron. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye. This is a special edition of Rook, episode 213, The Uprising. Our next guest is a musician, a singer, a songwriter, a composer, Negin Parsa. She was born and raised in Tehran. She has collaborated with artists such as Kaveh Yagmai, Ben Yamin Bahadori, and Reza Sadeghi inside of Iran. Negin moved to Turkey to pursue her passion for music within the last year or two, or should I say she was exiled to Turkey since she could not perform and play the way she wanted to uh, in Iran due to the repressive Iranian laws around women and musical performances. She's outspoken uh, with respect to the ongoing protests now in Iran and has long been a voice of dissent with the current regime. Her latest song, Zene Azadeh, was released a few days ago and has received millions of views. We did this interview a couple of days ago in the very studio in which she recorded that song. And um, please note that this emotional conversation is mo- mostly in Persian. Uh, this is an interview with Negin Parsa in Istanbul a couple of days ago. نگین جان مرسی حسین خوشحال شدم شما دیدم منم همینطور اولین um, که بپرسم how have you been feeling in, in دو ماه اخیر اگر میتونی if you can put it into words um, how have, how's your emotional state been خیلی وحشتناکه یعنی مطمئنم برای همه من همی حالت داره همطور که کمی قبل بهت گفتم شد خیلی هم میتونی یعنی این روزایی ما داره با قرصای خواب و آرام بخش داره مگذاره این من فیلم کنم اگر اگ، 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 که جز این باشه غیر طبیعیه به خاطر اینکه دستت وقتی کوتاهه وقتی میبینی چه اتفاقی داره میفته وقتی دوری اتفاقا به نظر من بدتره شرایط بدتره بعضی من میکنن میگن چجوری از بیرون از کشور تو میتونی اصلا حرفی بزنی مم. این من خیلی منو میرنجونه برای اینکه من اصلا من تازه اومدم من که هیچی که تازه اصلا اومدم ولی حتی برای کسایی که تازه نمیمدن مهاجرت کردن ما رانده شدیم از کشورمون بیرونمون کردن و ما رو محروم کردن از داشتن کشورمون و حالا کسی اجازه نداره به اون بگی که از بیرون ایران حرفی نزن راجع به کشوره اتفاقا فکر شما رو میکردم چون که وقتی که میگی وحشتناکه حالا واسه مثلا ما که ام um, سال سی سال چه سال توی کانادا یا آمریکا یا لندن و آلمان هستیم وحشتناکه شما من میدونم در این ماهای اخیر از ایران اومدی استانبول خیلی هم سخت بود اومدن اینجا اولین این یه کمی از اون تاریخ خودتون شیر بکنین که مثلا چرا چرا اومدی اینجا و چقدر سخت بود از یه خواننده 
زنی که هستی نمیتونستی کارتی بکنی تو ایران امه. خب من توی ایران اول که سعی میکنم زیر زمینه کار کنم از اون ابتدا فضای خیلی بسته تر بود اصلا برای رفتن و روی استه شرایط خیلی پیشیده بود کم کم یک مقدار فضا که باز شد به همراه کاوه یقمایی روی استیج رفتم قبلش موسیقی زیر زمینی کار میکردم و م... یعنی کار مجوز داره من که حالا وزارت ارشاد ایران به خود اجازه بده کار کنم روی استیج برم با کاوه یقمایی شروع شد این افتخار حالا نسلی من شد چون استاد عزیز من کاوه یقمایی من روی استیج رفتم و بعد از کاوه شروع کنم با بهترین های ایران کار کردن و مدام توی فعالیت های مجاز داخل ایران بودم تحت نظر وزارت ارشاد. ولی نمیتونستم از یک چیزی بگذارم مثلا روی استیج وقتی که میگفتن هجابت باید اینطوری باشه خب این دروغ بود من چجوری وایسم با گیتار الکتریک با هجاب مثلا اینطوری این یه چیز مزحکیه اصلا متناقضه مسخره است حتی شما ب... که اونجا بزرگ شدی به دنیا آمدی هنوز مسخره است هنوز آره. مسخره است یعنی برای منی که اصلا با اون بزرگ شدم من یادم که بعد از انقلاب اصلا بعد از جنگ آره. به دنیا آمدم ولی برای من باز این قابل قبول نبود به یه جور توهین بود میبینی که من اگر که صفحه من مرور بشه من از ایرانم که اومدم بیرون لخت نشدم <تصفيق> میدونی مسئله مسئله این نیست که مسئله یک جور, یک جور تعرض به آیدیای تو به فکر تو تعرض به یک جور مثل میدونی مثل بند بردگیه <تصفيق> که این باید روی سر تو باشه تا این یه پیام می داره که تو برده مایی <تصفيق> حالا این میخواد اینجا هجاب کامل باشه یا میخواد اینجا باشه پیام این باید روی سر تو باشه م- مثل مثل این گردنبنده <تصفيق> که قدیم مثلا برای بردان می بستن من این, این اینو نمی پذیرفتم و یه کم خب لجبازی می کردم توی کنسرت مثلا سعی می کردم تا واقعا این کار کم تا جایی که تونستم سعی می کردم عادی سازی کنم راجع به هجاب <تصفيق> این رو سریم رو همیشه میکشتم اقعا که توی ویدیوهایی که بعدش بیرون میومد خب من رو سانسور میکرد حذفم میکردن کات میکردن جایی که به من میرسید بعد گذشتی تصمیم میگرفتم با خودم گفتم که یه پارچه سفید روی گیتار الکتریک هم روی دست ببندم برم روی سیج ولی به من گفتن بچه ها گفتن که اگر این کار بکنی اصلا حراست سالم نمیذاره تو بری روی سیج من تمام پیام من تمام تلاش هم میکردم اون جایی که مثلا مصاحبه ای میشه توی ایران با من این پیام رو میدادم که نرم خواهش میکنم با ما راه بیایید ما موزیسیان ها قصد فساد و فحشا نداریم که ماها اصلا کارمون که بشینیم توی اتاق ده, ده دوازده ساعت تمرین کنیم ما هستم به پارتی کردن و به اون فحشایی که شما دارین اسمشون میذاریم وقت نمی کنیم برسیم و پیام میدادم که لطفا بازنگری کنین همش هستش مصاحبه در قوانین من از کسانی که در مسند قدرت هستن خواهش میکنم راجب خانم های موزیسیان نرم تر باشن مم. من هی پیام رو توی مصاحبات توی انستاگرام هم این پیام ها رو می میدادم این کار رو میکردم ولی اتفاق نمی افتاد و برای چیزای مسخره هی ما بازخواست می شدیم مم. مثلا با من مثال ما توی گروه بانوان که کار می کردیم همه خانم بودیم یک ویدیویی رو باید حاضر می کردیم خاننده می خوند موزیک آمده می شد نمونه کار فرستاده می شد برای وزارت ارشاد بعد که اونا تایید کن ما قشنگ انگار که مسلسل انگار که اسلحه گرفته right, بودن شاتگان right. گرفتن بالا right. سر ما این ویدیو هست که ما رو سریا تا اینجا کشیدیم نشستیم سرا پایین جدی اخم کردیم بدنامو میلرزید right. که این فیلمو برای وزارت ارشاد میخوام بفرستم خب این سوال اینجاست It's اون مرد right. اون مرد آه واقعا yeah. یعنی مردی که اونجا حالا نشسته داره اینا رو نگاه میکنه تایید کنه خب اون صدای خانم مرد نمیشنوه این اصلا Was there a moment? Was there a particular اتفاقی چیزی شده که گفتی دیگه دیگه بسه با از اینجا در برم برم استانبول چی شده بود؟ آی ببین اگر بخوام خیلی خوب خلاصه بگم سعی میکنم خلاصه بگم که چون خیلی ماجرای طولانیه من متاسفانه پدرم دچار بیماری شد که من همزمان که موزیک رو کار میکردم و سر تمرین رو میرفتم همزمان توی بیمارستان بودم یعنی من برنامه ریزی میکردم آی سی او تمرین آی سی او تمرین و پدر من متاسفانه درگیر مشکل جدی شده بودن و من برنامه ریزی میکردم برای لحظه لحظه که سخت بود واقعا بعد گذشت و من روی استیج میرفتم کارام میکردم بیماری پدرم بود مراقبت از نبود و من روی یه استیجی که رفتم من گفتم من دوست دارم لباسی که بر مهم بپوشم و لباسات یه مقدار اصلا خودش یه جور 
تابو شکنی بود کسی با اون لباس روی استیج نمیرفت من یادم شب قبل از اجرا همه به من گفتن که این لباس هم نپوش اصلا این لباس خودش دردسر میشه برای تو من مادرم گفتش که بپوش و برو روی استیج یه لباسی بود که حالا یه دونه پالتوی چرمی بود که یه مقدار اگزاجره بود یعنی خودت نمی ترسیدی؟ چرا؟ مادرت هم مثل که نمی ده. من, ه... من می ترسیدم و مادرم فقط یادم می تو چشمم نگاه کرد گفت برو روی استیج این تویی مم. اگر این تویی دیز... دیزاینرت بر اساس چیزی که تو خواستی رو برای تو ترهایی کرده مم. با همینی که هستی برو روی استیج منم رفتم روی استیج و یک لحظه موقع که اجرا داشتم به خودم اومدم دیدم که من بک وکال بودم دیدم سالان آدم ها هستن من رو میخونم بک وکال وکال اصلی اینا اینا مسخره هست yeah. yeah. من چشمام رو بستم شروع کردم سولو خوندن تک خوندن شروع کم خوندن وقتی که چشمان باز کنم دارن جیغ میزنن دست میزنن و در ادامه, ادامه دادم و دیدم سمت چپ من که این ور استیج بود کسی نمیدید دارن هوار میزنن فریاد میزنن که قطش کن قطش کن من توجه نمیدیدم نظر که من خودم این چیزها رو نمیشونم بفهمم So you're in a concert in Tehran and it's a mixed crowd men and women mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and of course normally women are not allowed to be the lead singers mm-hmm. when men are present so you start singing yes everybody's cheering yes yes I but you see singing. on the on the side lines the authorities are starting to get upset yes oh. yes. من خب یه خب جاهایی هست از هنجره که تو میتونی مثلا هیت بویس بخونی فاسه بخونی اینا من اونجا کاملا با دیافراگ خوندم و چست یعنی میکس خوندم که صدا می یکم رساتر از اون چیزی که حالا یعنی برسه واقعا اون صدا برداری اینا یه جور اسمشو بذارم لجبازی نمیدنم شاید میدونی به هم برخورد برای اینکه توی ساوند چک من و یک خانم دیگه که نوازنده پیانو بودن رو گذاشتن آخرین نفر هم. یعنی دیسریسپکت بود این ماجرا من نشستم روی صندلی بغز کردم که یعنی چی هم. ما این, این توهینه اصلا گولمون بزنین هم. ولی این احترامو بذارین که وقتی داری این همه سازار و صداشون رو میگیری لابله این ساوند چک ما طولی نمی کشید کلا ساوند چک ما یک دقیقه دو دقیقه طول می کشید هر کدوممون من و یه خانم دیگه که ایشون پیانیست بود من گیتاریست و بک وکال این بی احترامی به من که ساوند چکم ساوند چک من و ما که خانم هستیم باید توهین بشه و بیفته آخرین نفر من نشستم خیلی خشمگین شدم به برخورد به به هم برخورد بیشترین چیزی که میتونم بگم به من با من زن برخورد احساس کردم مثل نجات پستره مثل چیزی پایین تره خیلی برام گرون تموم شد اون لحظه ملکی گریه نمی کنم گریه کردم اه. حالا بعد شد رفتم بیرون گرچه که سیگار الان ترک کردم ولی یه سیگار کشیدم برگشتم ادامه دادم گفتم باشه خب بعد از این اجرا چی شد؟ بعد از این اجرا اتفاقی که برای من افتاد این بود که من ویدیو رو شیر کردم توی پیجم یه اینستاگرام خلوتی که بیشتر موزیسیان رو فالو میکردن نوشتم که تقدیم به زنانی که حالا درست یادم نمید ولی این آواز تقدیم میکنم به زنانی که حالا صداشون قطع شده تا فکرش راست نمیکردم یک ساعت گذشت دو ساعت گذشت دیدم که کل دنیا شده این توی نیوزا اینا شده ام. این جریان و من خیلی ترسیدم درستش خیلی ترسیدم غیجی به میگی من میترسیدم از یه, از یه راه, یه راه میگی میترسیدم ولی یه کارایی میکردی که لازم اون خیلی شجاعت باشی ببین آدم ها تر ترس یک قریزه است یعنی مطمئن باش شجاعترین آدم ها هم میترسن اون 
اون کاری که تو میکنی با اون ترس اصلا دو تا احساس مختلفه flip side of the same coin uh, two sides of the same coin uh. آره تو میتونی بترسی و یه کار خیلی mm. عجیب غریبی انجام بدی با ترست ولی یک احساسی هست ورای ترس اون احساس احساس خطرناکیه mm. اتفاقی که الان داره توی ایران میافته مردم میترسیدن قبلا الان تموم شد دیگه yeah. دیگه ترس رو ردش کردم و برای ترس چیزه اصلا یه فکری کردم که تو انگلیسی می زبان انگلیسی ممکنه بگیم we're in a post fear Mm-hmm. moment okay. yani okay. like we've graduated pa- we can never come back on on the the brave That's women and men of iran on but they po- they mm-hmm. asan tars dige tamam shod now it's move forward oz mekham tars mal green movement bu jombesh sabz hala har chi kesmesh hast alan rayeje tars un moqe bud ke masalan shahara khali havas jami bud tu shahara daqat mikaran kesi اصلا دا دا همه شاهد هم داریم میبینیم مردم دیگه بچه ها رو دارن میکشن همه همون رو دارن میکشن میدونی همه آماده این واسه این مردن ما مرحله ترس رو پاس کردیم تموم شده رفته یه فکر شما رو کردم چون که من یه دفعه هم دیگر دیده بودیم تا توی سامر بود نمیدونم که بود این استنبول خیلی یعنی legitimately obviously ولی خیلی عصبانی بودی از ایران you know you were just so angry at Iran for for forcing you as an artist to basically have to leave your homeland and try to figure something out in Turkey or come to Canada or whatever it is and when this stuff started to happen um, the, the new new revolution I mean as you began it's been happening for years it's led to this moment ولی کشتن مسا امینی و این قضیه دو ماه اخیر فکر شما را کردم چون که فکر کردم اینقدر عصبانی بودی بعدش میخواستم میرم نظر شما چی مثلا الان is it on some level has this been somewhat cathartic یعنی is it a release for you mm-hmm. to see people in the streets mm-hmm. young people fighting mm-hmm. back or does it somehow further the trauma mm-hmm. to you know see kids getting killed you know جیان من موقع که من بعد از اون اتفاق خوندن و یک سری اتفاقات من هی سعی میکنم خلاصه کنم مفصل بوده مم. چند بار دستگیر شدم و بازجوی دستگیر بازجوی آخرین دستگیری من آخرین باری که دستگیر شدم از لحاظ روانی اونقدی برای من گرون تمام شد که یه مدت کوتاه بعدش من سه تا عمل جراحی داشتم جراحی داخلی به خاطر اعصاب یعنی ات... این حد شکنجه مم. روانی برای من اتفاق افتاد فقط دوازده ساعت توی یک روز من بازجویی شدم و منو بردن توی یک جای چند جا که می بردن منو بردن توی یک جای یک آخوندی به من گفتش که بنویس می دونی اینقدر بعد پیک کرونا بود من اینو یادم مم. از مثلا ساعت نه صبح تا شب منو بازجویی می کردن از این بر با دستبان به اون بر از, از این پله به اون پله و من یادم میاد که پیک کرونا بود من ماسک داشتم همه چی داشتم همه رو دیگه کندم من روانی شده بودم آخر سر من بردن توی اتاقی که یک اخوند نشسته بود گفتش که رسید رسید عکسای من بود حالا فعالیتم فلان رسید به یک ورقی گفتش آه. که که من نوشته بودم جمله این بود که ما اشکال نداره که ممنوع کار شدم اشکال نداره که این اتفاقات افتاد عوضش ما راه رو باز میکنیم برای نسل بعد اینا که دید گفتش که بنویس منم مثل جنازه از تو پیچ نخورده بودم فقط نگاش میگم گفتم گفت بنویس گفتم چه بنویسم گفتش که بنویس با با هوشیاری کامل و با تصمیم خودم درخواست میکنم که منو بازداشت کنین و هر اتفاقی هم که بعدش افتاد با مسئولیت خودم خواهد بود اسم تو بنویس و امضا کن اون فکر من الان جیغ میزنم میگم مثلا چرا من خب میدونستم برنامه چی قرار من قرار بوده منو دستگیر کنن دیگه این دفعه دیگه ببرن من امضا کردم و بعدش دیگه به فکر کرونا نبودم منو چند جا بردن بردن زیر زمین اونجا از اونجا بردن پلیس امنیت زیر زمین پلیس امنیت منو لختم کردن تحقیرم کردن که به عنوان بازرسی بدنی من جرمم مواد مخدر یا فلان اینا نبود که من خوندن بود جرمم ام. چرا بعد منو لختم میکردن چرا بعد منو تحقیرم میکردن چرا بعد یک زند به من با جیغ میگفتش که 
لخ شد بشه این پاشه دست میزد به بدن من غلط کرد دست میزد به بدن من و و جالبه که از اونجایی که من لختم کردن بازرسی کردن تحویل گرفتن منو سوار یک ماشین عجیبی کردن که پشتش یک جای تر... یه فضای طبیعه شده بود یه فضای سیاهی که فنس داشت و پشتش سیاه بود م. تاریک و اه... اه... فلزی منو دستبند زدن انداختن اون تو و یک دری بود بسته میشه پشت اون یه کابینی بود که یک زن نگهبان نشستد و یه راننده که منو انتقال بدن به یک زندانی نامعلوم م. و من یادم به خاطر کرونا من اجازه دادن الکلم که یه اسپری الکل کوچیک بود توی جیب مانتون باشه من ترسیده بودم که حالا این وسط کرونا نگیرم چون داشت اون موقعی بود که خیلی می نوردن همه من الکل زدم ماه رمزون بود یادمه اون خانم برگشت گفتش که یه پنجره بود پنجره کشید گفت الکل نزن روزم باطل میشه من تا آخر عمرم این حرف یادم نمیره تو یک آدم بیگناه اسیر گرفتی تو از چه مذهب و ایدئولوژی داری پیروی میکنی که الکل نزن روزن باطل میشه تو یه بیگناه رو دستگیر کردی گرسنه توی اوج بیم یه بیماری که داره آدم میکشه دستگیر کردی و میگی الکل همین نزن... الان که داری میگی داری میلازی آره حالا فکرشو بکن که اون زمان من میگم بعد از این اتفاق من سه تا جراحی شدم و فقط یادم میاد که آزاد شدم توی بالش جیغ میزدم من من آخه من رومم نمیشه بگم میدونی چرا میدین اول اولین باره که من دارم راجع به این موضوع علنی صحبت میکنم برای اینکه من خجالت میکشم از نسرین ستوده خجالت میکشم از نیکا شاکرمی از سارینا از این از نیکا شاکرمی یه دختر بچه رفته روی ماشین وایساده و فیلماش هست من روم نمیشه قصه خودم رو تعریف کنم وقتی حسین رونقی الان پاهاش شکستم داره جون میده توی زندان من الان چون پرسیدی بهت گفتم و من روم نمیشه بخوام قصه خودم بگم ولی من گذشت و جالبه از اونجا که من رسیدم به یک زندان مخوفی که نمیدونم کجا بود چون فضایی که طبیعه شده بود یه فضای سیاهی بود من وقتی رسیدم اونجا هی میگفتن سر تو بگی پایین نه منو دوباره لختم کردن و دوباره همون تحقیر و آزار روانی و و توی یک سلولی که پنج متر سقف بلند یه سوله طوری بود یه همچین جایی بود و وکیل من وقتی که اسم من رو سرچ میکرده اسم من تو سیستم نبوده oh my God. و فکر که مثلا چه اتفاقی mm. بعد پدر مادر هستم که نمیدونی نمیدونن کجا هست من یادم. مادرم که چند ماه قبلش فوت شده بود یعنی من سای. اصلا ازادار بودم آه. موقعی که این دستگیری ها شروع شد من مراسم سوم مادرم که مراسم گرفته بودیم سه روز بود مادر من فوت شده بود اومدن به من گفتن بیا پلیس امنیت oh آره یعنی من قشنگ yeah. و و اینکه من وقتی که آزاد شدم فکر میکردم که تموم میشه و میگذره چی تموم میشه؟ بخشیده میشم و من قصد ترک ایران رو نداشتم اصلا نمیتونستم از روانی نمیکشیدم اصلا دیگه گفتم اصلا آرزوها ما خب نمیخوامشون من میخوام آروم باشم میخوام بخوابم اصلا بخوابم فقط یعنی اصلا روی اون کاناپه بر از که من آزاد شدم جای بدنم اصلا مونده بود انقدر خوابیده بودم یک روز دیدم یه پیامی اومد که دادگاه چهار بهمن به جرم انقدر یک پاراگراف بزرگ که اصلا هر کدومش رو من از وکیل میپرسیدم میگفتش که هفت تا ده سال زندان داره اینا اگر که بعد آخرش نوشته بودن که بزه انتصابی محرز بوده طبق تحقیقات نیروی فلان و اطلاعات فلان و فلان و فلان به زه انتصابی محرز بوده و هیچ شکی درش نیست که تو مجرمی اتهامت محرزه من چهار بهمن دادگاه داشتم و سه بهمن از ایران زدم بیرون یعنی روز قبل از دادگاه و, و وقتی که رسیدم اینجا فقط چند ماه طول کشید مثل کسی که زخمی خیلی تیر خورده زخمیه 
من یکم درمان بشم من درمان نشدم ما درمان نمیشیم ما ایرانی ها درمان نمیشیم به خاطر اینکه ما همه ما شکنجه شدیم مم. و من فکر میکنم حتی این اتفاقات هم به خوبی پیش برانطوری که ما میخوایم ما خیلی زمان میبره تا بخوایم سلامت روحیمون رو yeah. برگردیم yeah, I'm worried about that too it's, that's, it's a process البته که یک کسی که باشون مصابه کردیم همین توی استانبول این چند روز اخیر یه چیز خیلی خیلی جالبی گفت که گفت که این انقلاب it's like a collective healing for all of us <تصفيق> هم که گریه میکنیم هم که انرژی میگیریم و یعنی <تصفيق> تمام <تصفيق> این چهل سه سال تراما داریم uh, we're heal- we are a collect like that across the world the Iranians are healing at the same time as they're hurting you know um, which again are two sides of the same coin um, من ناراحت شدم که گفتی که you're taking by course بخوری که um, بخوابی you know, um, it's interesting for me that at the same time as you're dealing with your own trauma and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm guessing seeing what's happening in Iran mm-hmm. Nika getting killed mm-hmm. um, Sarah and all the people that you mentioned is triggering you people being jailed people being detained um, you haven't that hasn't stopped you from wanting to speak out and and be part of this I'm going to ask you about your anthem in a, in a moment but tell me about that decision tell me about um, walking the road between um trying to survive yourself through this mm-hmm. you know taking those pills to be able to sleep mm-hmm. but still wanting to be active and part mm-hmm. of this and throw yourself into this in a country that quite frankly it's not that easy to do that in in turkey compared mm-hmm. yes, to some other uh, places in the world yes yes um it's dangerous you know yeah. it's a risky too yeah. uh, that's what we've learned uh, yeah. um, ببین من کلا که میگم بهت گفتم حالا سیگار رو گذاشتم که نه برای سلامتی بدنم ما اینا قرص رو انتخاب کردم به خاطر اینکه یه موقعی هست تو قرص نخوردنه بیشتر از خوردنش به تو صدمه میزنه وقتی فشار وقتی شکنجه شدی مم. خب تو هی نخوری بگی مثلا به من پیشنهاد مشاوره شد تراپیست مثلا برم و تراپی کنم و اینا ولی من به تراپیست چی بگم من چجوری اصلا تعریف کنم اون اتفاقاتی که برام افتاده من, من نمیتونم اصلا دوباره تعریفش کنم دوباره باید بدتر قرص بخورم میدونی من دارم سروایو میکنم قرص و مراقبم تعدادش چقدر باشه فقط در حدی که من شب بتونم بخوابم همینقدر خب پس چرا میخوای با صدای بلند حمایت بکن یعنی yeah, nobody would blame you میخوام بگم میدونی هیچ کسی نمیگه به شما چرا میتونی مثلا یه پستی بذاری یا دو تا پست بذاری no one would say based on everything you've been through why aren't you on the front lines but you've decided to do that tell me about that decision به خاطر اینکه اصلا تصمیم عقلانی نیستش که تو پمسو بشی با این ریولوشن این عقلت نیست که به تو میگه که عقل میگه نکنی یه بازیه هر چی بشه چه ببره چه, باز... چه ببازه تو خودت قربانی نکن عقل میگه این یه بازیه مثل همه بازی ها ولی دل چی میگه دل میگه سارینا رو کشتن نیکا رو کشتن هننانه رو کشتن اسما زیاده خیلی زیاده اینکه اسما زیاده اتفاقه وحشت ها که من 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 هنوز در سوگ اوینم اوین چی شد جیان من هر راست شب میپرسم اوین چی شد چرا بسته شد مم. چرا کسی صحبت نمیکنه راجع آخه اینقدر اخبار داره پخش میشه every day there's so much going on we we can't even keep up you know مم. راست میگی اوین چی شد اوین چی شد اصلا نفهمیدیم و من همش میگم ببین ویدیوهاش اومده اون آتش سوزی بود و اصلا کاری به مسئله آتش ندارم مم. اون دود میکشه آدم میکشه تمام اون آدم رو میکشه اوین چی بود اوین چی شد کی میخواد به ما جواب بده مسئله عقل نیست من به عنوان یه آدم من شاهدم دارم میبینم دارن میکشن 
دارن میزنن دارن میکشن و بد دارن میکشن کسیف دارن میکشن ما دشمن هم بیشرفن دشمن میتونه دشمن باحالی باشه دشمن میتونه دشمنی باشه که تو به عنوان کسی که ازش نفرت داری آدم بدیه براش به عنوان دشمنت احترام قائل باشی قشنگ بازی کنه ما دشمن همون خیلی زشت و حقیرن زشت بازی میکنن زشت بازی میکنن حالا وقتی که میگی قضیه عقل نیست I mean, دالی درت you're following your heart have people told you listen Negijun, you're in turkey mm-hmm. don't say too much calm down have people said that to you چرا خیلی زیاد به خاطر اینکه هست حقیقت اینجا به قول یکی دوستان به شوخی میگفت در کشور دوست و همسایه خیلی ریسکیه شما چی میگی بهشون بسینی میگن من الان دارم به تو میگم من اون لحظه لبخم میزنم من, من نمیتونم استاب کنم برای اینکه درستم میگن برای اینکه خیلی جمله کلیشهی میخوام جیان به کار ببرم خیلی کلیشهی ولی خون من رنگین تر از نیکا نیست نیکای میتونست یه استار باشه مم. یه راک استار باشه خوشگل بود به همشون خوشگل بودن همشون مثل سیب تازه بودن چی شدن الان زیر خاکن و اونا از من چیشون بهتره جیان یعنی ببخشید یعنی من چیم از اونا بهتره خون من رنگین تره عشق تو هم دارم بودم I mean, you're right. That's the thing. You're right. Um, no, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're supporting me. I'm. You're the one who's put the. Tell Tell me about the. This. This song that you've put out recently, um, Jesus Christ. Okay, the when you make a gofti, the skin of you, um, ragged. What you gofti? What you gofti? Very good. It's not a different color from Nika, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's um, and you're so right. Like, um, it, it makes me sad for Iran in general. The all of the potential. You know, for the last, not just the kids who are being killed now, all of the potential for the last few years, decades, mm-hmm. that has been destroyed. Mm-hmm. You know, all of the potential st- that you know yourself, you you stand up because, frankly, there aren't that many Persian stars in the world in in, in music. There's a mm-hmm. few. We know them. They're great. Mm-hmm. We love them, but because they, there hasn't been a a country fostering supporting allowing them it that that uh as a musician it's it's um it'll never stop being horrifying to me you know va ya millat inam ke adam nemitune sukut kone goftam aqlani va mantiqi nistesh ke mantiqet mige nakon in kar vali un tasvir ke to dari mibini و جیان یه چیزی منو آزار میده که نمیشه از همه توقع داشت که جرعت به خرج بدن یا بیان ولی من تعجب میکنم از تفاوت آدما که سکوت میکنن یکی از اون و دومین چیزی که تعجب میکنم من بیشتر از جمهوری اسلامی از طرفداران جمهوری اسلامی در عجبم چون جمهوری اسلامی میتونیم بگیم که داره از قدرت اشتفا میکنه ما میتونیم اینجوری خودمون رو right. کنیم اونا توی مسند قدرت هن everyone likes power they've got power that's the, they're enjoying it دارن سروایف میکنن میکشن و دنبال قدرتشن من تعجب میکنم و 
عصبانی میشم و من, من از درک من خارج از طرفداران جمهوری اسلامی احساس میکنم اینا کجایی هن؟ اینا یعنی دی این ای مشترک با ما دارن اطلاعات ژنتیکی مشترک ام. با ماها دارن چطوری میشه تو مگه فکر نمی کنی تو تمام این ویدیو هست با چی دارن گولت میزنن احساست یعنی بهت نمی این, این, این خیلی دردناک و تلخ اه، اه، کسایی که اینطوری هن. و یک چیز دیگه که دوست دارم بهت الان بگم که شاید از این تیریبون استفاده کنم بتونم صدامو به چهار نفر برسونم اینه که این وسط واقعا مردم یه سری چیزای هاشیهی رو کنار بذارن از ریخت هم خوششون نمیاد اون گروه از این گروه خوشش نمیاد الان واقعا دشمن هممون یکیه یعنی گاهن میبینم سر ایدئولوژی های بیهوده به جون هم میافتن سر حتی یه سری خصومت های شخصی به جون هم میافتن این خیانت این خیانت به تمام خونایی که ریخته شده این بزرگترین خیانته یعنی هر کسی من معتقدم توی هر جنبشی توی هر گرد همایی هر فعالیت که ما جمع شدیم با یک خواسته و اگر کسی به هاشیه برد خائنه داره خیانت میکنه داره انرژی این همه آدم رو میگیره که دارن زحمت میکشن هرکی اندازه زور خودش من نگین پارس اندازه توان و زور خودم دارم چنگی میزنم تو اندازه خودت اونایی هم که توی خط مقدم جنگ توی ایران هم توی خیابون هم اونا هم که دیگه ستودنی هم اصلا نمیشه راجع بهشون حرف زد ولی کسی که این وسط بیاد به هاشیه بکشه خائنه هیچ هاشیهی وجود نداره یک چیز وجود داره وحدت ما علیه جمهوری اسلامی و اتحاد ما این چیزیه که وجود داره Let me, let me ask you about نینجان الان فقط سه روزه چهار روزه که یه آهنگی یه شعری شما پخش کردی که چطوری میگن ترکونده این میشه گفت یعنی it's already become one of the anthems of the revolution of 2022 um, you recorded it in this studio yes exactly these are the words I mean John you know خط شماست؟ نه. نه. خط شماست. Um, tell me about the decision to make this song. مردم. خیلی کتا. مردم راجع به احساسش بخوام بگم که موقع خوندن خب برای من یه جور هیلینگ بود. هم. من ببین میدونی رنج از یک جایی فراتر که میره تو با حرف دیگه قادر نیست جملات وزن رنج رو نمیکشن فقط با جیغ بزنی فقط باید با صدایی که مادر نیکا مادر مهشاد شهیدی مادر این بچه که کشته شدن جیغ زدن مادر محسا امینه جیغ زد با جیغ بزنی هیچی نمیتونی بگی تو به اون مادری که بچهش بچه دست گلش پرپر پر شده تو چهار تا آهنگ بخونه چی بگی What were you thinking when you while you were singing that song we see the video of you singing what was going through your head you were talking about how it was almost a release for you a catharsis um, چی فکر میکردی وقتی که میخونی؟ تمام شعر رو احساس میکردم یه جورایی میدونی توی چیز توی یک خلایی بودم خیلی میدونی کار ما خیلی با منطق همراه نیستش ما تو کارمون باید دیوانه باشیم حالا اصطلاح به قول حافظ که میگفت گرد دیوانگان عشق مگر که به عقل عقیل مشهوری راجب اینی که دیوانگی رو اساسا حافظ یک مزیت میدونست یک اتفاق خوب در انسان میدونست و اینکه کار ما هم اینجوری که باید تو کارمون دیوانه باشیم اصلا اون لحظه دو تا چهار تایی وجود نداره فقط اون احساس از اون دیوانگی است و مادمی که آسیب به کسی نزنه البته 
از شعرش از لیریکش یک کمی تعریف کنم ببین خب یه بر اساس شعارهایی که این روزا داده میشه که خیاب اینا هیز تایی هرز تایی زن آزاد منم دیو تایی فتنه تایی مرد آزاد منم این خوب شد پرسیدی من دوست دارم یک چیزی بگم انقلاب زنانه یک قسمتی توی این شعر هست که میگه تو اقتشاش خاندیش انقلاب زنانه شد صد در صد همینطوره انقلاب زنان است این انقلاب با اسم محسا امینی شروع شد با کشته شدنش با مظلومانه کشته شدنش شروع شد و من از سن خیلی پایین همیشه توی تظاهرات ها بودم حتی اون موقع که خیلی وقت پیش بود سال 88 همون جنبش سبز من یادم میاد که زنها همیشه جلو بودن هم. من یادم میاد کوچیک بودم مثلا سن کمی داشتم ترسیده بودم رفتم میدون انقلاب روزی که یه شنبه بود که روز قبلش نماز جمعه بود گفتن که دیگه هر کی بیاد بیرون فاتحش خونده است من اون شنبه رو میدون انقلاب بودم من یادم میاد که زده شورش ما رو دورمون رو یه دایره زده بودن ما رو در واقع حبسمون کرده بودن چند تا دختر دانشجو قداشون هم کوچولو بود من ترسیده بودم زانوم حالت خالی کرد یه دفعه از صدای این که اینا باتومشون رو روی سپراشون میکوبیدن وقتی که مجموعه این صدا میشد یه روبا وحشتی میداد که خب من ترسیدم زانوم یه دفعه خالی کرد دیدم چار پنج تا دختر منو گرفتن با جسته های خیلی کوچولو و زریف منو گرفتن با لبخن به من گفتن که نه ترس ما هستیم اینا دور تا دور منو گرفته بودن که من آسیب نبینم بعد این اینا به ما فشار آوردن زده شورشی ها هی میکو بودن فشار آوردن فشار آوردن تا یک جایی باز شد همه فرار کردیم و کتک زدن من خیلی سری میدوام من خودمو نمیبخشم که من سری میدویدم و اونو جا موندن اونا با اتوم خوردن من نخوردم و وقتی که اینا پشت سر من جا موندن من دویدم رسیدم به یه کوچه بومبستی رفتم تا اون کوچه یک دختری که توی سرش باتون خورد ماهی بلوندی داشت ماهاش قرمز شده بود با من رسید و التماس میکردیم میکویدیم به در خونه که در باز کن کسی در باز نمیکرد من این سحنه ها رو دیدم انقلاب زنان است انقلاب زنان است اما انقلاب زنانه اگر قرار باشه به عمل بیاد و تکرار انقلاب پنجا و هفت باشه که مردا رو به سلابه بکشه من نیستم توی این بازی ما داریم میگیم حقوق برابر زن و مرد من از هر تفکر رادیکالی پرهیز میکنم انقلاب زنانه است احترام به جنس لطیفه جنس ظریفه احترام به زن نه کشتن و یقه کردن مرد نه کوبیدن مرد به عنوان یه جنس خشن پس فطرت زورگو کی گفته ما داریم اونا رو مردا رو توی ایران دارن بچه ها دختر رو دارن نردبون میکنن مردا مردای ایرانی که یک عمر در جهان اسمشون اینطوری بود که اینا زور میگن به زنا دارن پشت انقلاب زنانه میجنگن دارن تیر میخورن کشته میشن برای انقلاب زنانه این خیلی عشق بی قید و شرط میخواد تو سینه سپر کنی بری بجنگی خونت ریخته بشه برای چیزی که به اسم تو نیست به اسم زنه ستودنی حیرت انگیز این میزان از عشق و غیرت نیست در جهان اینقدر شرف اگر قرار باشه کسی سوجویی و تندروی کنه و به اسم حمایت از زنان بخواد حق و حقوق مردان رو 
بخواد بگه ما زنا ما زنا ما زنا مردا مردا من تو این بازی نیستم و اجازه نمیدیم اجازه نمیدیم این اتفاق بیفته ما خیلی کشته دادیم پسرای 16 ساله به هر تصاویرش هست حرف نیست حسین رونقی ما داریم می جنگیم برای برابری زن و مرد برای عشق داریم می جنگیم برای اینکه همدیگر رو بغل کنیم برای اینکه به دور از تفکرات زشت جنسی محکم همدیگر رو بغل کنیم زن و مرد و ببوسیم دست همو بگیریم زن و مرد این الان سه روز این آهنگ پخش شده مثل که دو سل میلیون نفر اینه دیدن اصلا باور میکردی که Did you have any sense that this is going to become this um, viral anthem? نه ببین کار ما یه جوری اتفاقا شروین حاجی پور یک جواب جالبی داد راجع به هیچ شدن موزیکش خیلی درست و جالب بود ما هیچ تصوری نداریم برای موزیکامون چه اتفاقی میافته اصلا قابل پیش بینی نیستش اصلا من خودم شخصا وقتی کار ریلیز میکنم اصلا منتظر اتفاق نیستم مثلا این نگاه اصلا نمی کنی که مثلا چند نفر چرا آها. ولی اینی که حدس و گمان این که میدونی همون بیقید و شرط هست که تو با عشق داری اینو میدی بره این عشق من تقدیم کردم من این اینو اینی که چه اتفاقی براش میفته اینا از کسی کمک بخوای که مثلا این آهنگه هست به نظرم جواب نمیده باید خیلی یه جور شاید من خیلی سپریچوال فکر میکنم شاید خرافاتی هم یا هرچی اگر اسمشو بذاریم هرچی ول کنی ماجر رو میدونی هریس هرس بدون هرس کارت انجام بدی بهتر خب انگار انرژی و وایبه پشتش میاد که تو واقعا منظورت فقط همون چیزی بوده که تو شعر گفتی Has there been some kind of reaction to it either from a lot of people or one particular person or something that surprised you that that moved you can you share something that somebody's told you about how this song has affected them خیلی پیام داشتم جیان اصلا خیلی اش وقت نمیکنم ببینم خیلی سعی میکنم حداقل لایک کنم مثلا تا جایی که میشه چون باید احترام گذاشت به مردم حالا از همین جا میگم که دست تک تکشون رو میبوسم و مرسی که به من افتخار دادن واقعا قبولم کردن موزیکو قبول کردن دوستش داشتن من تلاش خودم رو کردم دستشون رو میبوسم ولی چرا من دوستم به چه روی اکشنی گرفتی که عجیب بوده که اصلا فکر نمی کردی که یعنی اور سپرایز شدی آه دیشب یه ویدیوی دیده که روی یک پرده ویدیو پروژکشن ویدیوی من بود پشتم کاخ سفید بود وایت هاوس بود داشتم یاد این افتادم که میخواستن کاخ سفید و حسینیه کنن مم. داشتم این خیلی خنده دار بود و همه مثبت بوده خیلی اتفاقات مثبتی بوده منفی هم چیزایی نبوده که به چشم بیاد منفی ها که یاد like you were singing projected onto the white house اره هستش بودی it's very interesting آره 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 ولی میدونی همیشه اینجور اتفاقات موقع میفته که تو تو حالت تلخی هستی میدونی تو دیگه شاید یه روز دیگه ای بود یه حال, حال هوای دیگه ای بود خوشحال میشدم ولی در حد جالب بودن بود برام در حد خوشحالی خب ما نمیتونیم خوشحال باشیم این روزا مگین how does it feel to you to be in استنبول at this time. I mean, you're not that far away from Iran, but you're far away enough that you can't be actually in the protests uh, in Iran, protests that you said that as a little kid that you were um, in, involved in. Do you feel some, on some level, I'm not suggesting you should feel this way, I'm, I'm curious, do you feel a, some level of guilt? Like, 
you wish you were in Mashhad, you wish you were in Tabriz, you wish you were in Tehran on the front lines somehow. خیلی زیاد، خیلی زیاد. یعنی اولین اتفاقی که برا من چون از چند نفر پرسیدم همین سوالت رو اولین اتفاقی که افتاده بر همه این بوده که همه آرزو میکردن ایران میبودن. همش میدونی دستت کوتاه خیلی بده جیان خیلی بده شاهد باشی همه الان میفهمن من دارم چی میگم کسایی که خارج از ایران هن البته بعد تا فکر منی که تازه تازه اومدم و همیشه بودم اینی که دستت کوتاه بر هم جیغ میزنم احساس میکنی کاش که میبودم کاشکی یه کاری میتونستم میکنم و من شبا قبل از خواب حالا شاید قیافم نیاد ولی فقط دعا میکنم میگم بعد تو دعا نمیگنجه آخه چجوری مردم و تک به تک یه جوری حالت عجیبیه میگم خدای موازه به مردم باش مم. تصور میکنم ایران رو تصور میکنم با بچه ها با آدم ها پر از نور تصور میکنم تو ایران میگم خدای من نمیدونم چجوریه ولی به تو سپردم یعنی هر شب قبل از خواب هر شب و شاید کم حرفم حالا نه اگره اگره من میخوام یه یه ستوری با شما شیر کنم که like the power of this revolution um, من دو سه هفته پیش میخوام دو سه دو هفته پیش یه مصابه کردم با تلفن با یه خانم یه دختری توی محشد <تصفيق> اسمش هم میخوام بگم آزاده خودش هم میخواد میخواست آزاده اسم واقعه واقعش مصرف بکنه همون جا توی تظاهرات بود توی محشد دو بعض از نصف شب داشت با من داشتم مصابه میکردم باش یه چیز خیلی she said something so powerful گفت که من سی سالمه من تمام رو عمرم عصبانی بودم که دختر ایرانی بودم یعنی گفت می گفت که ام انگلیسی هم می گفت که I feel like I was cursed why did I have to grow up an Iranian woman گفت که اصلا I felt like I was Hitler in a previous life so they reincarnated me and made me an Iranian woman a place where I can't sing and dance and do all the things I want to do I've had this anger towards Iran I know some of this it resonates for you because I know you um She said, in the last six weeks at that time, last couple of months, her own feeling mm. about Iran, based on watching her sisters and her moms and her brothers and dads and, and sons, you know, out there uh, fighting for freedom, her own feeling has changed. So, uh, so, and it was just so powerful for me because I think we're all feeling this in, in, the, in the world, this rebirth of uh, some kind of Iranian pride based on those young people who are, and what they're doing and those women on the front lines, all of what we've talked about today. But for a woman in Mashhad who's still there to say this two months has changed her life mm -hmm. in terms of the way she sees herself mm -hmm. was so powerful. And I wanted to tell mm -hmm. you that story and ask you, If that resonates for you, yes, if that makes sense to you. Yes, everything has changed. To in Panja, Rose, that I was just very sad. So, you know that I had a lot of anger. But in the end, it's not a matter of the situation. It's a matter of your life. It's a matter of how you handle it. It's a matter of how you handle it. It's a matter of how you handle it. It's a matter of how you اتفاق اصلا یه جورایی خودداری میکنی از یعنی یه احساس عجیبی قبلا با هم صحبت کردم راجعش و یه روزی یادم میاد رفتم یه جا منم یه چیزی بخرم یک آدم نایسی بود یه آقایی بود پرسید که where are from گفتم ایران خیلی با افتخار و بچه هایی که توی ایرانن تا عبد آبروی ایرانی و ایرانو خریدم چی کار کردم؟ چی کار کردم اینا؟ جهان داره تحسین میکنه جهان حیرت کرد از, از 
شجاعت و اتحاد و اون حرفی که زدم مردا دارن می جنگن واسه ام. زن زندگی آزادی Yeah, I was actually telling someone today, you know, all of the iconography of this revolution uh, is a woman, uh, sometimes a single woman, arm in the air, empowered, and it should be, and it's strong, and it's, it's an amazing image. But it's so cool, I mean, that Iranian men, you know, they talk about patriarchy and all this, an entire, seemingly an entire country of Iranian men, we know there's some outliers, um, Are, are not complaining about that poster. I'm mm -hmm. not saying, no, we need to be in the front, you know? Uh, everyone is accepted and, and which is, I don't even know if that would happen in America. You know, that's a, it's a very progressive kind mm -hmm. of idea. Um, let, let me ask you a final question and um, it may be an obvious question, I don't know, but after all you've been through and after that dramatic exit from Iran and You had plans to come to Canada, etc. Agar Iran azad shod, hala vakti ke Iran azad shod, bami yadi. Aare, definitely yes. Aare, Papa, maksam man ke taza asan madan. There's no question in your mind. Ah, in mustabarat, Iran yek guruhi, yek guruh Hollandi budan, amada budan te Iran. من ممنوع کار شده بودم هنوز بازجویی می شدم یک گروه هلندی اومدن از من همین سوال پرسن گفتن از یه شکل دیگه مم. گفتن که خب تو همه چیز برات مهیاس بخوای بری از ایران قصد داری بری گفتم نه اینجا خاک منه دوست دارم بمونم و دوست دارم کاری بر اگه کاری میکنم برای مردم کشورم انجام بدم تو ایران این حرفو زدم برمیگردم جایی نداریم بریم مم. مال ماست کشورمونه اونایی که باید برن کسایی دیگه که باید برن نه نه خاک همه کشور همه نگین thank you so much for joining this thank you for sharing your story your honesty your emotions It's, thank you for uh, having me thank you very much مرسی <laughs> that's great as a conversation with نگین پارسا in Istanbul a couple of days ago. Uh, thank you again to Negin for doing that and being as open as she was. We're going to play that song, Zana Azadeh, her um, anthem for the revolution, uh, or the second one she's done. Actually, she did another song as well, but this one that we talked about in the interview that has gotten so much attention will we'll go out on that song. Uh, in the meantime, thank you um, for listening. Thanks to all of our guests. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Savvy Roham, Talented Anahita, Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Ahai Mertad, and Yushaya. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please do subscribe. If you haven't done so already, you can um, also support us uh, as we crowdsource by going to our website, rookmedia.com, and pressing the Support Us button there. To find me on Instagram at Giango Meshi, Mizun Bashin, Here's Negin Parsa and Zane Azade. Please, to you, Arze to you, Zane Azade Manam, Deep to you, Zetne to you, Marde Azade Manam, Hindi Garafzane Nis, the Hawk is a monetary, Hindi Garafzane Nis, Kobe, oh, and your manam, Peace to you, Arze to you, Zane Azade Manam, Deep to you, Zetne to you, Marde Azade Manam, Hindi Garafzane Nis, the Hawk is a monetary, Hindi Garafzane Nis, Kobe, oh, and your manam. یارومی روم یا زنگی زنگ انتخاب کن که با کی به جنگ یا این بر گود یا اون بر گود انتخاب کن شمشیر از رو ببند هر چه تبر زدی مرا زخم نشد ترانه شد تو اقتشاش خاندی اش انقلاب زنانه شد هر چه گرفتی تو زمن نبید جا بدانه شد صدا گرفتی زمن و سکوت هم این ترانه شد چه تبر زدی مرا زخم نشد ترانه شد تو اقتشاش خاندی اش انقلاب زنانه شد هر چه گرفتی تو زمن نبید جا بدانه شد صدا گرفتی زمن و سکوت هم این ترانه شد 
توی زن آزاد منم دیو توی فتن توی مرد آزاد منم این دیگر افسانه نیست زهها که زمان توی این دیگر افسانه نیست کابه آهنگر منم پیست توی حرز توی زن آزاد منم دیو توی فتن توی مرد آزاد منم این دیگر افسانه نیست زهها که زمان توی این دیگر افسانه نیست کابه آهنگر منم